uh, Katrina, this uh, uh, this talk would be uh, live on YouTube and also recorded. Yes, thank you very much. We'll send you the link once it's done. We'll Wonderful. put it on your site and you'll get more genuine likes. Of course. <laughs> Of course, if Vijayan has joined. We are live now. We are live. So, hello everyone. Good evening. Uh, I am Deva Priyakumar, a faculty member at uh, IIIT Hyderabad. Uh, firstly, uh, I am very, very glad to, um, you know, uh, and ha happy to welcome you uh, all, the invited speakers and the panelists of uh, today's evening, and also everyone who has joined us via uh, different platforms. So, in, in spite of it being uh, very late in the evening, midnight, uh, for Katina, for example, or early morning for some of you, we are grateful that uh, you could join us and be part of this uh, event. So this is the first event that uh, I have data under the Applied AI Initiative. INAI is uh, at Applied Hyderabad is organizing with uh, hopefully plenty more to come in the future. So just quick words on uh, IHOP data. So the Department of Science and Technology has uh, selected some institutes in the country to establish Technology Innovation Hubs under the uh, National Mission on Interdisciplinary Cyber Physical Systems. So IIIT Hyderabad is in the process of establishing one on um, data-driven uh, technologies applied to areas like uh, mobility and healthcare, which is uh, IHUB data. So since the activities are uh, at the hub or mostly around data and today being the International Data Privacy Day, we are very happy to have our first uh, event uh, today. Right, so um, data raises a lot of uh, questions. For example, data on what we do, where we go, or what we buy, or health, etc., is uh, continuously being collected every day, mostly without us knowing. And this raises a large number of questions like uh, fairness, accountability, uh, privacy, transparency, ethics, etc. So, of course, on the other hand, the data-driven technologies are indeed disruptive and are fundamentally changing the uh, landscape of uh, technology in general. Right? So I hope uh, we will discuss some of these aspects in the next uh, couple hours. Um, without taking much time, I hand over to Dr. Uh, Kavita Vemuri, faculty member in the Cognitive Sciences Research Lab to take it from here. So again, thank you and welcome you all. Thank you. Kavita, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Deva. Uh, on behalf of the Institute, I uh, extend a very hearty welcome to Professor Katina Michael. Uh, it's very nice of her to actually join us at so late time. Uh, she's a professor at the School for Future of Innovation in Society and School of Computing, Informatics and Decision Systems Engineering at Arizona State University. Uh, previously, uh, she was Associate Dean International at the University of Olongong, that's in Australia. Uh, where she's employed in the School of Computing and Information Technology. Uh, her, uh, you can read a lot more about her work on her site, but uh, for interest and from the academic side, in 2017, she was awarded the Brian O. O'Neill, Brian M. O. Connell Distinguished Service Award from the IEEE Society for Social Implications of Technology. She has uh, published six edited books, and uh, one of the books is very interesting, Innovative Automatic Identification and Location-Based Services from Barcodes to Chip Implants, and Uber Valence, uh, Social Implications. And she has written more than 200 peer-reviewed papers. She's a guest editor for uh, many IEEE proceedings and, uh, and journals. And uh, she was editor-in-chief of the IEEE Technology and Society magazine from 2012 to 2017 and has been a senior editor for IEEE Consumer Electronics Magazine since 2015. Uh, there's a lot of things I could say more about her and her work and her experience in this area, but uh, I won't listen to her and I'm sure all of us are. So we thank you again for the immediate acceptance uh, when we sent out an invite and most importantly for the time for this interactions. Uh, thank you once again on behalf of the Institute, we thank you for the time. Uh, over to you, Katrina. Well, thank you so much and honored to be with you all today, uh, Professor Kavita and Professor Deva and all of you uh, for coming on board and listening on this very important day, which raises privacy awareness with respect to data science and artificial intelligence and health and well-being. 
I'm going to share my screen here for a moment if I can. And um, I will present a short PowerPoint package. And um, let me just uh, stop sharing for a moment and make sure that I share with my sound. There we are. And my hope is that by the end of this presentation, I am able to uh, have raised your awareness on the potential for what we term ubervalence with my husband, MG Michael and fellow collaborator. Ubervalence was a term he coined way before there were deep fakes or fake news or disinformation uh, on the internet, for example. This, this term was coined in 2006 and entered the Macquarie Dictionary. And ubervalence has some shortcomings, misinformation, misinterpretation of data and information manipulation. And what I want you to be cognizant of is while we are collecting data for care, that we do not fall into the pit and the shortcomings of misinforming, misinterpreting and manipulating the information we gather in a way that was never meant to retrospectively. Here we are talking about issues of consent. We are talking about data redundancy. We are talking about data storage and data breaches. And we are talking about personal privacy. So in the old model of mass surveillance, we used to want to know about who is within our purview, who is within our constituency, how many people, how are they scattered in the public? What's the density of an area? What's the surface area? How many products has person X and Y purchased in aggregate? We've run census surveys every five or six years, depending on which country we are in, that collects data in different geographic boundaries, whether it's at the state level, the local government area, statistical districts, statistical divisions, collection districts that are no more than 250 homes past. And this information has been gathered for service provisioning. It's been gathered so that government is able to adequately provide support to citizenry. But we are shifting away from this model. We constantly are hearing large corporations say, we are not interested in the data of individuals. We are just interested in the aggregate information. We just want to provision our networks better. We just want to offer the end user the services, you know, they should be getting. But in fact, we are starting to ask questions about the person and the personal and the private. And we are asking questions about who in terms of identity, where in terms of location, when in times, of time, what, what condition are you in? What's your context? And if I know who you are through an identity token, whether it be your face as a biometric or on your handset, the IME number or some kind of ID that you carry in your wallet, I know a lot about you. But sometimes I argue that location is more important than identity. If I know where you are on the Earth's surface at any given moment, I have some idea of your context. Are you at the top of a mountain? Are you near water and moisture? Are you enclosed in a space, in a dwelling fixture? Are you surrounded by other people in a crowd? Location tells us a lot about proximity to others, social networking, we often derive the location using global positioning satellite systems, but increasingly we can use Wi-Fi. And even more, we are investigating the capacity and capability to use even PowerPoint sockets to know where is the signal strength and energy source being drawn from. And we are getting closer and closer and closer to the individual, the proximate, not just the fuzzy, we think they are in this town, but the exact X and Y coordinate. And if we are dealing in non-Earth units because the person is inside the, a dwelling like a shopping mall, we know which shop they have just recently gone by because we do path routing intelligence. 
we know even whether you stopped outside a window shop front to look and browse at a new dress. We know whether you took a break. We know whether you had children with you. We know, we know, we know more. And what condition you are in is often dictated by your temperature. If I'm holding a handset and my hand is against the handset, often it can measure stress levels. It can measure, measure temperature. It knows whether you're outside or inside protected. It knows my speed, how fast I'm traveling. Am I on a train? Am I on a bus? Am I walking? Am I on a bicycle? Am I exerting energy? It knows things like distance. And if I know two of these three things, then I can derive the third element. Time, distance, speed is all interrelated. So if I know who you are, where you are, and what condition you're in, then I can probably denote what you're doing and what you're about to do. And if I gather this information over time, I not only have the predictive element, but I have the historical data. And this is when we start to look at machine learning, artificial intelligence, predictive patterns. And human activity monitoring of all people individually has consequences for human rights. So this mentality has grown through proactive criminalization. This thought in law enforcement that says, if I can use big data to bring many islands of information together, I can tokenize and I can give points and ratings, then I can analyze both the structured and unstructured data in real time or near real time. And I've got a pretty good chance of figuring out whether you're a criminal or not. In fact, I could probably tell by your face Many people argue that about 80% of criminality can be presupposed just by looking at someone's face. You look like a criminal to me. And if I know where you are and I know your visual image, I've got a 90% chance. And if I keep going with more and more data, I could be pretty accurate that you might well be a criminal. So I can prevent crime or I can convict prematurely. But what does that do to human rights? So that's about security. And if I take that one step further and I say, well, forget about the criminalization. I'm interested in health. I'm interested in medicine. I'm interested in precision medicine, proactive medicine, medicine that helps you not get sick, medicine and proactive, reactive um, support. That means prevention and save the system much more money and save healthcare costs. So I can use big data in this proactive medicine scenario and I can analyze both structured and unstructured data. And there's a good chance I can prevent disease and treat the patient better. So I take this model in the criminalization world and I turn it upside down and I say, look, we used to do this for law enforcement. We still do to an extent, but what if we were to introduce this model of surveillance in the medical field? What if I could gather data that could help you not get sick, encourage you to move when you're uh, sitting down for too long. And so we're shifting away from the security framework that says total information awareness of the populace to this model that says, look, people move around. There are fixtures that are static, but there's also dynamism. There are people and things that generally move. And what I'm starting to do then is wanting to know what's happening in here. You know, some of us might wish we could have surveillance cameras in the mind as those neurons were firing between uh, each other uh, in synapses. And so we are reminded here of George Orwell's classic quote, nothing was your own because Big Brother was watching except the few cubic centimeters inside your skull. But I will argue in this talk that not even that is our own anymore because what we're doing is we're introducing different types of trackers. We can look at patterns of behavior. This is a study I did with Andrew McNamee back in 2005 using a chunky GPS kit called the Magellan device. And we realized that humans were creatures of habit. Day in, day out, one month to the next month, we do the same thing. And you can see that the graphs here compared from the 17th of August to the 24th for a university student doesn't change that much from home to university, from home to university to work perhaps. 
And so then we are empowered by these incredible visualization tools. We have satellites now that can show us to the micro dot, you know, uh, what is happening. So I can zoom in from this globe, this amazing fixture and go right in. And you can see this speck here in New South Wales where I did this study. And I can wear things like track sticks that are GPS units, you know, in the size of a small USB. I can fix things to a vehicle for 30 days and monitor every three seconds as the vehicle moves around. And I can place a token on the human and the person. But I don't need specialized tokens because I have this. This is my tracker. It's not permanent and it's transferable, but it's an incredible device with 14 sensors on board. So I can place these track stick units within different contexts. I can strap them to cars, I can strap them to people, I can strap them to anything and I can denote movement. And here we are in the same global image zoomed into New South Wales on the South Coast. This is the starting location, the originating point, the destination point, and we can sort of start to figure out what someone is doing. Please don't be fooled, this data is gathered en masse for individuals. That's how we build on our mobile network systems. And I can visualize in many cases, uh, things that I see as I traverse. So if I have an X and Y coordinate, I can do fly throughs to see where the person has been and their point of view. In fact, using social media technologies like Periscope, now I can actually tune in to your IP address and look at what you're looking at through your point of view, if you're wearing the adequate glasses or video, holding the adequate video camera. And so here are this incredible, rich, time-stamped information collected by these units. I can export them out. I can interrogate them. I can look at patterns of behavior. I can look at longitude and latitude, altitude, temperature, uh, how many satellites are fixed, uh, what course you're taking. Is it southwest, southeast? Uh, what's your status in terms of how fast you're moving, you know, 68 miles per hour. What was the date, you know, the timestamp and the actual individual record if I'm taking a timestamp every 30 seconds. In this instance, you can see it's every eight seconds, but I can fiddle with those parameters. But what does that tell us, especially when we're looking at new technologies, emerging technologies that were once in introduced like the Fitbit that are now being considered as measures for predicting someone's symptoms with respect to uh, transmissions of viruses like COVID-19. What if everyone wore a Fitbit and I could denote that someone was prematurely going to have a heart attack or in fact, they were sedentary uh, ongoing um, in an ongoing basis? What if I could predict uh, that someone was coming into proximity with a COVID case? What if I could even figure out someone was asymptomatic and didn't know they were spreading the disease? And so these are studies that are being conducted between Fitbit and Stanford University today, uh, where people donate their data to try and figure out if there is a way to respond to pandemic crises. But it's all about this metaphor. Imagine I put the phone in my head. Imagine this here could tell us what someone was thinking. And is that the case? As we divulge more and more of ourselves on social media publicly, and we are unable to recapture what we have divulged. Sometimes this is in the form of vlogs, YouTube clips, things that we share, things that we may later regret, things that perhaps were captured of us and tagged to us, but that we have no control over. And so these are the dynamics. Has the phone become a thought process think tank that is now shared in a very explicit way? And so what George Orwell used to presuppose that this was secret is no longer secret. The physical behavior manifests in the neurological. And so here's a short clip of what I mean. The following is an example of how Zafti identifies mental health issues. This sample data is from a 29 year old male living in California. The top section details individual app usage and the amount of time in each app whereas the bottom section shows it's the total daily phone use. From this, you can see a dramatic spike has occurred. We have multiple algorithms monitoring for deviations. Others look deeper to examine what has changed. 
Firstly, browser usage increased dramatically and a private browser app was downloaded and installed. YouTube and Netflix has doubled. Movement sensors have dropped. Step count is only 20% of long-term average. Three work days have been missed. We have learned his work patterns and locations. Perhaps he is ill or on leave, but there is more. When looking at social media, suddenly Twitter and Instagram are being opened again. Use of WhatsApp and Telegram increase. Discord starts being opened. A range of new apps are used. Psychology test apps, couple quizzes, personality matches, two dating apps are briefly installed and used, and holidays are looked into. What does this all mean? We predict that on the 3rd or 4th of November, this user went through a breakup. They've called in sick to work. They've been looking at social media, perhaps stalking their ex, and searching for answers as to why the relationship ended and looking to get away on a holiday. This is a small portion of what we do. Additionally, we look at hourly usage of phones, every unlock, every app open, and the amount of time in each app. This is baselining behavior patterns. For example, here is Facebook, and here is WhatsApp. Now we can watch for deviations. We actively track exercise patterns through apps. This user likes to run every other day. Our system watches for behavioral patterns and monitors for changes continually. With technology on over 700,000 devices, Zafti is using advanced algorithms to passively predict mental health events through a single app. Now friends, the corporation behind Zafti is a company based out of Melbourne, Victoria, Bugbean Software. And I was asked to come on board to understand the privacy implications of a software such as this. Imagine being able to denote someone's mental health condition by looking at their behavior explicitly on a handset. This is an ethical minefield. If we all believed we were being monitored in this way, would we act a certain way? Would we conduct the behaviors as we would? The US Army is looking into applications like this to prevent suicide in its defense force. In schools, these kinds of technologies are being used to look at cyberbullying and the prevention of suicide. In many other cases, we could probably encourage people to get counseling if they were going through a divorce or some kind of uh, life event. But the question is, what is the fine line between the gathering of this data and the potentiality for misuse but also for misinformation, information manipulation, and misrepresentation. Because a user does certain things, does it necessarily mean they are engaged in a life event? Are we curbing their freedom and free will to act in a certain way? No one wants the loss of life, but the question is, how far will we go? And if we can use these tools for prevention, what makes us think that companies will not use this for behavioral economics to drive more traffic? Oh, so you are going through a life event. I will shovel through to you more. You are at your most vulnerable. I will give you things that you think you need because I tell you you are vulnerable and you need my services. What if this was a form of addiction by design? What if this was a form of manipulating the market at a time of vulnerability? So let us hold those thoughts for a moment. Technology is coming ever closer to the body, which means that the readings we are going to gather are not just going to be long, longitude and latitude location information. We're going to know things like heart rates and pulse rates. We're going to know vital signs and characteristics. We're going to know a lot more as we introduce new kinds of devices and new technologies that are a network enabled through Wi-Fi, Bluetooth or any other number of sensor networks. Biomedical companies like Medtronic want to implant sensors in everyone. Why not be the hub of hubs, the coordination device on the body? And this is a 2014 article. But as we are inventive and live longer using different types of prosthetics, what might this mean for a variety of operational scenarios from luggable to wearable to implantable? and insertable. 
mobile phone with an implant perhaps, maybe what we're really talking about is a black box beneath the skin, just like on a flight recorder. Imagine some kind of device, a hub device worn or embedded in the human body to denote what is going on. So I leave you with these final thoughts, going from the physiological to the neurological, this notion of access of access, who has access to this information that is being gathered? Has the proper consent process taken place as we endeavor to create wonderful new tools that will help humans? What are the risks and the problems and perils of ubervalence? Is it really unintended consequences or they were intended? And here we talk about three things, misinformation, misinterpretation of data and information manipulation. And I end on a slide that shows the shift that we are going through, a shift in the techniques for data collection. We used to knock on the door and ask for the person, the householder's opinion. What do you think? I will fill out my survey while I'm looking at you. Big companies have now moved away from door knocking. And for some time they were calling and people stopped answering the home phone because there were too many calls coming at dinner time. So now I do not use, I do not knock and I do not use the phone because it's too disruptive. No, I tell you, use your device and I will figure it out because you tell me everything in that search box on the internet, on that social media platform that you use and on the devices that you strap to your body. And so we're going away from this person to person data collection to this network based tunneling in, knowing exactly what you're doing, what you're asking and what time you are in your process of life events. And so there's social media, there's multimodal biometrics, and of course there are more invasive systems. But in my concluding remarks here on health and well-being, I want to ask you the question, do we really, really care? Are we listening to the user with humility? What do you need? Or are we grabbing what is not ours and using it in a way that we shouldn't? How will we inform the end user? This is what we are doing with your data. Yes, you went through a consent process, but that was five years ago. What about today? Do you realize we are recombining your data with new data sets and trying to do discovery that might help you in medicine? So I encourage you to consider the approach of co-design. How will we invite the user with us to co-create, to co-produce, to be hand in hand a participant, but also equal in the design process to say, what is it that you really care about in your health and well-being? And I stress again, the fine line between health and well-being and surveillance. Are we doing surveillance for good? Is this tech for good or for bad? And how will we protect the data that we gather and we utilize? So let's think about this conundrum as public interest technology in earnest for care. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Professor Katrina. Uh, in uh, respect to time, so uh, I I'm just going to read out a couple of questions that came up in the chat. Uh, the first one is, of course, uh, given that uh, the future is in federated learning in healthcare, where most of the data is processed at the client end, and it's not shared with the nodes, um, what is its impact on data privacy um, in, in terms of are these questions that you raise still valid when you have a, a different kind of a model like federated learning? There is um, so much to argue between a federated model and one that is uh, more local, I would say. Look mm. at Australia, for example. Look at the personal health record. It does have to do, I agree with the person asking the question, uh, the architecture of the system. In the case of Australia, the introduction of the personal health record uh, was a centralized system and unfortunately uh, really did not look at some of the personal privacy question. It is no wonder that so many people opted out of the personal health record system uh, here in Australia, the medical record. So depending on the architecture, yes, there is a way we can actually overcome some of the issues with respect to uh, centralization or decentralization and to protect users. But I always believe depending on the data that we collect, you know, the process of de-identification, the process of pre-processing, the process of uh, recombining that data with third-party data 
is crucial to have some kind of regulation and legislation around uh, this concept. So I'll leave it there so we have time for the next question, uh, okay. Professor Kavita. Yeah. So uh, the next question is from Professor uh, Kumar Guru. He's, uh, he's actually a faculty, a visiting faculty. He was a visiting faculty in IIIT now in uh, IIIT uh, Delhi. Uh, his question was, given that privacy expectations is very subjective, especially driven very much by culture where we are from, wondering what your views are on topics that you would like to see researchers study in India, which can help researchers outside India to compare and make system design policy design. Uh, and the question, the next question is, uh, given that you spoke about social networks, what would be three problems, three key problems in social networks that you think PhD students and researchers should work on? Wonderful questions today. Um, my first response, and I wish I could see, still see that there. Sorry, here we uh, are. Uh, can uh, I've got it, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I think you're right. It is driven by culture. It is driven by norms. It is driven by the legislative system in the country. A lot of this is known in the socio-technical and environmental conditions that we analyze, the value chain, the stakeholders, uh, how uh, innovation occurs in a, in a given country. So I do believe that is accurate, that culture does play a big part. Um, my views uh, on the topics that researchers should study with respect to India, I mean, for me, the, the primary thing is looking at the ADA system and the retrospective use of the ADA system and the multimodal biometrics in a number of uh, areas of health. And we're seeing this, you know, COVID-19 responses with the COVID app uh, specific to India that was built and this now dotted line relationship between um, these numbering systems that were never instituted uh, for these health responses and yet are increasingly uh, scope creep and function creep feeling their way out to the outer. But I do believe you are right. It is about systems design. It is about embracing responsible in innovation or value sensitive design or this privacy and security by design as Professor Ann Kavukian says, how do we embed values in systems, not after as an afterthought, but in the beginning of the creation and the development before deployment, way before prototyping and implementation, when we are talking about problem definition and then saying, okay, aha, we are going to now uh, with the user together, go through this process, not keep the user far away and say, we are developing this for you, but in an empowerment of the end user and the empowerment of health and well-being, we bring the end user along the journey, not as a token lip service, but embedded in the design process. This is very hard. It's complex, but it is a new way that people are thinking about this. So the three things uh, I would say for social networks, uh, one is of consent. One is of um, the ability to be forgotten. And the third is to the empowerment of the individual who owns the data. I'm sick and tired of these large institutions and organizations owning the data. Friends, the data is ours. We have to know it's lifetime and the data is almost alive. How can we follow this data through its cycle and lifetime? So with that, uh, I leave that back to you, Professor Kavita. Yeah. Uh, there's just one more question. Uh, yes. This, this would be the last question. No problem. Uh, we have seen implications of social media and big data companies like Facebook on influencing elections worldwide uh, negatively. How would Uber villains affect this? How do we transition from pri personal privacy to protecting our democracy from threats from data monopolies? Well, I could have showed you so many antitrust legal cases, uh, even against Google, uh, even about the potential purchase of uh, different kinds of uh, smaller uh, companies. You should look at the uh, meshed links between conglomerates and companies they are purchasing you would be surprised that some of the largest social media companies and some of the largest handset providers are actually insurance companies and health insurance companies at that. So ubervalence is about knowing more than, than, than what the user wants to actually give. Ubervalence is not so much a wonderful positive thing. Uh, I don't think we can actually do that. It's about control in the form of, and the guise of care and convenience 
but it's about penetrating within the individual. Yes, we want better healthcare. Yes, we want to know whether someone is taking their tablets on time and to assist them with behavioral tracking so that they could be healthier. Of course we do. Who doesn't want a population that uh, has less disease and prevention is better than cure, right? It costs the economy so much money. But when we start to look at how we can maneuver and almost in a puppet string like marionette way, we can determine uh, as one person said, Facebook knows more than you yourself. Of course it does. It even knows more than your mother knows about you. It even knows more about you because you can't count when you're tired, the clicks and discrete things that you do. So for, for us, it's to be aware that these large conglomerates are influencing election and who knows what else. Our propensity to buy something, our impulsiveness to do something, the way we act and behave with our children, what we may actually say online. You know, this is... This is the thing, are, are we becoming smarter as consumers? And why do we feel we can't resist? A lot of citizens do not realize their power. If we were to all stand up and say, enough, my privacy is being encroached, they will listen to us. They do not want to lose the clicks. They don't want to lose the advertising dollars, but it, this whole model is driven by advertising and we have to change the model. We have to get away from this advertising based model, which doesn't work for citizens. We are not products. We are not productized and customizable. We are people and we have to respect each other. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Katrina. Uh, I think uh, we could have asked a lot more questions. I'm sure there are a lot more interactions, there are a lot more questions too. Maybe we would have called, invite you another time, a better time for you uh, for a talk, a longer talk um, and answer most questions, okay? Thanks a lot uh, for your time. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kavita and uh, Professor Katina uh, Michael. So uh, the next, uh, you know, with the next talk, I would like to uh, invite Professor Vikram Pudi, another faculty member at uh, AAAD Hyderabad. And he is also uh, leading the efforts on uh, the Data Foundation in uh, IHUB. So please, Vikram. So uh, thanks, Deva. It's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Uh, so Dr. Rahul Panikar. He's the Chief Research and Innovation Officer at Vadhwani Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, Rahul is an MIT TR35 awardee, World Economic Forum Social Entrepreneur of the Year, Industrial Design Society of America gold winner, and an echoing Green Fellow. He holds an MS and PhD in Electrical Engineering from Stanford and a BTEC from IIT Madras. Rahul was the co-founder and president of Embrace, a venture-backed Stanford startup that has helped over 3 lakh premature babies in over 25 developing countries and whose product the WHO recognized as a top innovation in global health. So uh, over to Rahul. Well, thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, let, me, let me maybe share, um, share my screen so that I can share some slides. Uh, okay, is that coming through? Yes, it's visible now. Great. Uh, and let me see. Okay, so I'll have to switch to the other tab. Sorry. Okay. Ah, there we go. Right. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm I'm Rao. Uh, Lovely to have this opportunity to talk to all of you. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the sort of work we're doing and how that ties into uh, deploying AI at scale, uh, targeting applications for underserved populations in developing countries. Um, one of the problems we work on is um, identifying low birth weight babies. Okay? Uh, and this is, a, this is a large problem. The so. In India, something between 25 and 30% of all babies born are low birth weight. Uh, they, they weigh too little when they're born. Um, and world over, there's about 20 million of these babies born. Uh, the UNICEF uh, show um, uh, has data suggesting that the um, uh, less than half these babies are actually weighed correctly. At Hello, birth. Rahul. Uh, so your voice is slightly low. It is audible enough, but if it is possible to increase it a little. Let me see if there's something I can do there. Hold on one second. Huh? Mm. 
let me check my audio settings just sit a bit closer maybe that will do uh, is this any better much better yes okay yeah i it was a uh, um, my setting was too low sure okay uh all right uh screen share is still working or no no the screen has gone okay let me go back to sharing there yes yeah all right yeah, so uh, I guess what I was telling you was there's about 20 million uh, low birth weight babies born world over every year, and less than half of them are weighed correctly at birth. Um, and this um, uh, this accounts for roughly three to four million babies in India uh, every year. And um, this is how th these babies are weighed in the community right now. Uh, frontline health workers, ASHA workers, Anganwadi workers go home to home with these devices called spring balances. And um, they put these babies in a sling and weigh them. Now, multiple challenges here. Um, you can see the number of people it's taking to actually do this. There are also cultural challenges, like, you know, um, families are reluctant to have outsiders weigh their newborns. Uh, and you can uh, weigh their newborns, uh, and there's cultural taboos uh, preventing outsiders from touching a newborn baby in the first 30 to 40 days of life. And you can understand the reasons. It's um, who knows how many babies have been in that sling before this baby was put in there, right? And finally, there's also uh, there's all sorts of data quality issues. Uh, this is not an atypical register. Uh, this is from Rajasthan, and you can see up to that point in the year 2019, every baby born in the area covered by this particular healthcare worker magically weighed precisely 2.5 kilograms. And why 2.5 kilograms? Um, because 2.5 is the cutoff for uh, low birth weight babies, uh, for low birth weight. Right. So these are the sort of issues that we're dealing with. And so one solution that we are developing is uh, a visual weighing machine. Uh, so healthcare workers, oh, India has about 1 million ASHA workers, world over frontline, oh, there are millions of frontline health workers. And increasingly, they're getting equipped with smartphones. And digital pipelines have been established uh, thanks to M Health solutions. And so, uh, by take we're developing a solution where they take a short video of the baby, uh, no contact, and from that we can do a full 3D reconstruction of the baby without ever seeing the backside, and uh, from that estimate uh, estimate weight, a head circumference, and length, and other parameters. Um, one of the reasons is actually babies are fairly constant density, by the way. Um, it turns out we're, we're, I mean, we're mostly water. So, and when we are born, in fact, we're even more uniform. Um, there's, I mean, I'm happy to go into technical details of sort of uh, what's underneath the model, but here's an early demo. Uh, this is on the left, you see the input video. It's actually taken on a generic Android phone. Uh, it's not, not even a high-end phone. And uh, we can do a 3D reconstruction. Uh, early results, uh, again, we can, uh, we're looking at this as a classification problem in identifying low birth weight and very low birth weight babies. Mm. And currently we are, uh, in fact, latest, now, we are at an MAE of roughly, uh, of less than hundred grams in weight error in these hospital settings. Uh, you can see um, the 3D reconstruction also happening off the backside. And in fact, left to right is very low birth weight, low birth weight and normal. And you can see the increase in reconstruction size as well, as well as size and girth. Um, underlying this, what we use is a, um, a is a learned deformable model. So basically, we use a latent representation of baby shapes. So simply put, it's this: if you were to represent a human baby as a uh, mesh of vertices, you need roughly seven thousand vertices or so to get a faithful representation. 7,000 vertices, X, Y, Z coordinates, that's 21,000 real numbers, right? But not all 7,000 vertex meshes are babies, right? Uh, 7,000 vertex mesh can be used to represent a mug, can be used to represent a car. So if we restrict the 7,000 vertex num uh, meshes or 21,000 dimensional space to um, realistic baby shapes, it turns out that it's a much lower dimensional space uh, and to represent shape, you need about 20 dimensions and 
about 70 dimensions to actually 70 numbers to express pores, which are joint angles. Uh, so with roughly 90 numbers, you can actually represent uh, a baby fairly well. And this is in fact a baby morphing. And the shape is actually obtain, obtained by doing a PCA in shape space. Um, happy to uh, sort of go into details, but basically it's a principal component analysis done in shape space. And this is a baby morphing through the first four eigenvectors uh, in that PCA space. So in fact, you're really seeing eigenvectors of babies here. And that's what you're seeing. Uh, and using this, uh, this is some uh, performance uh, that uh, early results from a community setting where backgrounds are more complex, lighting is more complex, et cetera. And uh, we're working on a sort of getting performance there so that we, we can have field experiments. And in fact, to, in order to do the 3D reconstruct, while inference time, we only use uh, 2D videos uh, for inference. Uh, for uh, for learning, we use we also in order to especially in order to create the three D model, we also three uh, D scanned a small number of babies, about one hundred fifty babies. This is the first time ever that newborn babies have been three D scanned in four pi steradians. We actually got the equipment to do this. It's done at ten frames a second at fifty micron resolution. Right. So, um, I, I went into some of these details so that you get some context about the technology, but I'd like to abstract out and also tell you about sort of the problems we are looking at. Uh, our overall goal is not just uh, uh, measure birth weight, but also do growth tracking, especially in the first thousand days of life, um, which is uh, which are the most critical days. And off the first thousand days, of course, is the first year that's most important. And then within that first month, and then first week and first day. Uh, lots of co-creation happening in the community setting. With that, I'll um, my I'll share a little bit about my personal journey on sort of how I got here. Um, as was mentioned when I was introduced, um, I, I I got my PhD at Stanford, um, and my background had nothing to do with babies or healthcare. Um, I actually worked in convex optimization algorithms. And um, you know, writing proofs, developing online algorithms, and applying that to optical systems. Uh, that was lots of fun stuff, and I enjoy my math. But I spent time at the Stanford D School, the design school at Stanford, and uh, some work we did there is what got me into the space. I, uh, with some, with my teammates, developed uh, an incubator that can work without electricity for premature and low birth weight babies. Uh, and you know, in the class, we had a prototype from it, and um, we also realized that uh, if we if we did not, uh, if there was a partner organization in the class. It was a, a non from Nepal. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, they were not interested in taking it forward. And we realized that if we did not do anything about it, uh, this was going to sit on a shelf. And meanwhile, we also realized that this has the potential to have a lot of impact. So uh, my teammates and I, four of us, two Indians, two Americans, we put all our belongings, shipped it to Bangalore. Uh, I, you know, and I land up in Bangalore. We set up a company. Company is called Embrace. Um, long story short, 2012, we went to market and um, we got European medical device regulatory approval. We, um, we started um, selling in the private segment in India and then soon got uh, deployed in government facilities. And we scaled to, um, by 2016, we scaled to over 20, uh, over 15 countries and maybe about 200,000 babies. Now we've easily crossed maybe more than half a million babies, I'd say, or more. I don't know the latest numbers. And the WHO procured from us to help babies of Syrian refugees in Jordan. So at that point, I saw through a licensing deal to a larger company, and that's when the Madhwani Institute was being set up. And Anandan, our CEO, who's a, who formerly used to be the managing director of Microsoft Research, is a well-known computer vision researcher. He's our CEO, uh, and we, you know, uh, we got in touch, and he asked me if I'd like to join him. So since then, we've built up the institute. We're about 100 people or so, and lots of lots more problems we're working on. As we look at our the problems we work on, I think it's important, especially in the social good space, to realize that AI is only one piece of the puzzle. Right? Um, there's an overall context here. So, for example. In the case of, uh, in the example you saw of uh, the visual vein machine, um, 
the there is the algorithm, but all of that goes into a product. And in this case, what we're looking at is this should not be a standalone app. It should actually be a feature in any number of existing apps. And so we work with these M Health solutions that are already deployed at scale and uh, are looking at integrating this as a feature, right? So there has to be a product around it, but the product alone doesn't form a solution. You also now need to modify workflows. So for example, how does a frontline health worker and ASHA workers uh, decision-making change? How does her supervisor's decision-making change? What about the primary healthcare center doctor, a state level health official and so on, right? So workflow modifications are important. And finally, all of this has to integrate into a larger system, which in this case is the home-based newborn care program. So that's how we think about this. You do have to take the entire system into, uh, into the picture and design for that in order to be able to achieve skill. Otherwise, it's easy to come up with lots of technical prototypes that uh, do cool things, but won't necessarily translate to scaled impact. Right? To achieve this, there's, there's seven questions we ask, uh, which is, First of all, is it a big problem? Uh, kind of obvious, we are interested in solving problems at scale. And so uh, is, this, is this a problem that is big, both in uh, scale and severity? Right? Um, does it have an AI solution? Lots of problems don't have AI solutions or not even technical solutions, right? Uh, many of them are people problems, for example. Uh, will solving the AI part make enough? This is an important one. Uh, lots of problems out there, you will find an AI component in there. Uh, but you know what? So many of them solving the AI, AI, the AI part is not the bottleneck. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, something that we initially started working on, which is uh, sputum microscopy for a TB diagnosis. Oh, we thought, okay, that's um, that's an easy, relatively easy computer vision problem. We can collect some data, and you know, it's a it's object detection and counting. Uh, but we quickly realized that you know that's not going. That's not the bottleneck. The real challenge is in collecting the sputum sample, preparing the slides, right? And if you have the skills and the infrastructure to be able to do that, peering through a microscope and seeing, are they stained bacilli showing up is not really the challenge. And so we dropped that problem. Um, will the solution be accepted by stakeholders? Uh, that's an important one because many, in many social uh, impact problems, there's a complex ecosystem of decision makers. It's not just the end beneficiary or the person administering the solution. There are decision makers up the chain, including administrators, funders, uh, regulatory agencies, et cetera. And so it's important to uh, ask, will it be ac accepted in various parts of the chain? Okay. Um, my favorite example here is actually decision support systems for primary healthcare center doctors. They don't really want them uh, because if you ask them, typically you'll hear, what do you think? I don't know what I'm doing. Or if I keep using the system, my patients will think I, I don't know what I'm doing. So what may be actually a good solution that has the possibility of impact may not necessarily translate to impact if stakeholders are not willing to adopt it. Um, does the data exist or can it be create, created easily enough? Um, in many of the uh, problems that, are, uh, that we work on, we realize that the data doesn't exist and so we go and collect the data and create the data sets. Um, are there partner organizations uh, who can help co-create, uh, who have the trust of the community with whom we can pilot, who will help us refine the solution and refine the problem uh, itself, right? And finally, uh, you don't want to get stuck in the land of pilots, right? And so are there programs, large scale programs and pathways to be able to scale these solutions up, right? These are just some filtering lenses that we apply in optimizing our efforts for scaled impact. And what makes it a fortuitous time to work on AI-based solutions are there are multiple forces colluding to actually make this a favorable time. Like I, I mentioned digital pipelines, smartphone penetration is tremendously increased, which provides us compute interface uh, and uh, network, uh, communication network and storage, right? All of which are very important. Um, and you have large frontline workforces who actually provide the human interface for many of these solutions. Health has frontline health workers, agriculture has agricultural extension workers, and so microfinance has its own organizations, uh, frontline workers, and so on. Across sectors, you'll find large frontline workforces. And again, lots of technology accept, generally higher level of technology acceptance now uh, than uh, 
than some time ago, possibly maybe five, than maybe even five or 10 years ago. And there's also a lot of policy and funding support. I did want to draw upon sort of one distinction that you'll find in some of these problems uh, that's different from, uh, in working on these problems that's different from academia. Usually in academia, this, this is typically what we do, right? Uh, given a data set, sort of what's the best model we can build to optimize for a metric that we're interested in. Uh, and this might be on an existing task, in which case we want to implement the metric and uh, set, uh, set a soda, or, uh, we, or it may be a new task, right? but this is the typical situation. But in, if we look at impact, uh, that's not entirely the situation. Even the data is a free variable. What we want is for a given problem and the desired impact, what is, it, what is the best data to collect uh, and the model to build? And there is also some degree of freedom in a deployment channel. I would say the deployment channel is a little more constrained, okay? but there is some freedom. So for example, in the previous example you saw, you can ask, is that something that should be solved at the level of a frontline health worker, or is it better to solve in a primary healthcare center or in a birthing facility and so on, right? Or, or should it be something that targets parents? Right? So deployment channel does have some options, it's more constrained, but the data is not a given, right? That's a free variable. That's important to consider here. And so it's, it's more degrees of freedom. Um, and so we sort of at the intersection of the technology world and the social impact world. Uh, and these are not necessarily worlds that know how to talk each other's language, have very different cultures. Um, and, uh, and, so, and, and so as an organization, we're sort of half in, impact folks, half technology folks. Um, I also quickly touch upon another example of what we do, uh, which is, and there are many domains we work in. This is in agriculture. What you see there is a, uh, is a cotton ball. And in the center, you'll see a little worm. It's called the pink ball worm. Uh, this worm um, devastates cotton crops. Um, and in fact, there have been ball worm attacks over the last few years here. And uh, typically when large scale attacks happen, in fact, I think in 20, 18, it was or 2017. There were um, roughly a thousand cotton farmers committed suicide, uh, and large uh, large swaths of the cotton crop were wiped out. And cotton is a crop that supports something like 100 million families uh, across the world, right? And so it's a very important cash crop. So what we are trying to do, uh, and there's rampant use of pesticides in cotton farming. Um, in fact, in India about 50% of all pesticide used in the country is used on this one crop. And in spite of that, you have the situation of large swaths of cotton crop being wiped up. Uh, and the, so the solution we're developing is one involving pest traps where uh, agricultural extension workers and lead farmers can actually take a picture of the trap. And from that, we can identify which ones are the pests, which ones are pests and which ones aren't. And there's always a background level of pests. It's only when they cross a certain threshold that one needs to take action. And at that, it's called the economic threshold level. And at that point, we give guidance on which particular pesticide to apply, how much, and when. Uh, this is also in um, pilots right now um, and uh, in multiple states in India. And we will also be looking at doing pilots internationally. I'll skip over some of these details. Uh, um, and, and I realized that we are short of time. Maybe I'll, it, I'll touch upon some important factors to consider as we think of uh, social good applications. Um, and before going into that, there's multiple other domains we work in. We work in tuberculosis where we look at, can we predict which patients are likely to uh, fall off treatment um, because that leads to drug resistant TB developing and drug resistant TB is a scary problem that's developed it has started primary transmission, in fact. Um, uh, we also look at uh, um, automating certain processes within uh, TB diagnostic facilities so that uh, they can start treatment earlier and so on. Uh, and we have lots of, and we have a bunch of COVID related work as well that we've done, for example, identifying COVID from by screening cough and voice cells, and we, we have meaningful performance there. Um, as well as helping various city administrations. Right? But in many of these, you'll see these are there are complex stakeholder ecosystems here. Right? 
And so our teams tend to be multidisciplinary. We have researchers, we have engineering, we have program managers who are basic, come from these domains. So in health, they're doctors, come with public health experience in agriculture, they're folks with agriculture and rural development expertise. And then we have product managers, designers, and so on. You, I mean, these complex problems need interdisciplinary, te multidisciplinary teams, right? Um, things like explainability are important. And I would say it's a, it's a complex question. For example, in the first uh, uh, example of newborn babies, it's important to ask explainability for whom? Is it explainability for the mother who has to choose whether to panic or not about her child? Is it about the health? Is it explainability for the health worker uh, who is administering the solution and um, uh, has the trust of the community and risks losing that trust from giving false information? Is it for the supervisor of the health uh, frontline health worker? Uh, is it for a state administrator who has to decide whether to deploy the solution or not, right? Or is it for a funder uh, or a national policymaker who again has to make uh, decisions along these lines or a, or a regulatory body or for a developer who needs to understand if the model is working right or not, right? So these are not entirely straightforward questions to answer, right? And I'll come to some of this, but maybe if I were to stress on one thing, it's actually about doing evaluation and people often ask, sort of, how do we think of evaluation? Uh, and the best um, and the best systems out there that we know uh, that involve technologies that are not familiar to uh, the users or the beneficiaries. It actually comes from drug testing, right? Where you have the notion of phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. Phase one's typically lab testing, which in our case is typically evaluate on test set. You're really looking at his performance, right? Is uh, and is it uh, is it not doing harm? Uh, then you want to sort of test in a control setting, right? Control pilots, which is if 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 used correctly, will it bring benefit, right? That's efficacy. And then you want to go into testing into more un uncontrolled setting, which is in real world usage condition, does it bring benefit? But if I were have you uh, in evaluation, if there's one thing that I would suggest is very, very, very important. It's actually post-deployment monitoring, which is you will never be able to anticipate all the things that can potentially go wrong with, uh, with the new technology. And so it's important to continuously keep an eye on what's happening because that's what gives you the feedback loop to take corrective action. Um, and finally, I'd say, so uh, just as we ask, what can AI do for social good? What can social good for do AI? There's lots of interesting, questions uh, that this throws up that are fruitful areas for research, right? As you saw, that are interesting vision problems, lots of problems in weekly supervised learning because getting labeled data is hard, right? And there's unlabeled data out there. Uh, it's important to be able to learn from small data, lots of domain adaptation problems because data is heterogeneous. Um, many problems that we deal with are ultimately for a policymaker is causal in nature, which is what they care about knowing is, so what should I do? What intervention is necessary to to cause a certain change, right? And um, going all the way down to policy level questions, right? As we grapple with these important technologies. I'll end with putting one of my favorite quotes from Krauss, which is um, the real voyage of discovery lies not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. So with that, I'll invite you to see the tremendous possibilities that exist if you if we see our problems around and look at it an ai lens thank you thanks rahul uh, so uh, for the very enlightening talk i mean it it, uh, it was definitely great to see uh, how ideas can manifest in the you know to actually reach lakhs of users and you know to actually make an impact okay so there are a couple of questions uh, on the chat so uh, there's one question on, uh, can we make this assertion that India is going to be the center of gravity in healthcare driven innovation in tech for the coming decade, given the high impact of projects from Google, Microsoft, and uh, uh, from nonprofit initiatives led by government and startups and so on. And that moves, moves on to what is your viewpoint on the data availability and acquisition challenges in India and what can we do about it? Right. Um, 
I uh, so uh, uh, the first question was: Do we expect India to be a hub for healthcare AI innovation? Right. Uh, my, you know, I've spent uh, close to a decade in um, doing technology for healthcare right now, uh, and uh, both India and globally. My own take is the potential exists, but we should not take it for granted because there are also some significant challenges. Um, the potential is great because large volumes of data uh, exist that can be uh, aggregated if done correctly. Um, the there is a large need, and this is and healthcare is a situation where AI will not, will not be labor replacing, uh, and therefore and therefore and is a vital necessity. Right? Uh, I would say the key challenges that exist in the domain is um, one we don't have robust regulatory mechanisms. Okay? And in the absence of regulatory mechanisms, either the developers themselves have to be regulators or the doctors who are end users end up having to play the role of regulators. And developers being regulators is not a good situation because there's a conflict of interest. Uh, doctors being regulators is not a good situation because doctors are not qualified to assess technology. That's not their training. Uh, and so they, uh, you'll often hear the need to go do randomized control trials because that's what's typically done in drug trials, right? Uh, and you know, we asked about effect size and things like that. But, I mean, so um, that that is another challenge. Um, and finally, there's in private healthcare, there's a conflict of interest as well, by the way, right? Which is the doctor is also the business person, and so. Um, a doctor is in private healthcare is not necessarily incentivized to minimize costs for a patient. Um, that's that's so. There are challenges on the regulatory side. There are um, there are also uh, there's also a requirement for robust uh, data governance mechanisms if we're talking about AI based solutions in healthcare, right? And patient protection systems, etc. I would say you know we do have some systems in place. Uh, but executions of the execution of these systems um, is relatively weak compared to um, global goal standard. Uh, and finally, I think there is also a cultural divide between the medical community and the technology community. And uh, that cultural divide needs to be uh, bridged. Um, neither community uh, is entirely welcoming of the other community. I see, I see a difference in sort of the younger generations, but more needs to be done to bridge that cultural divide. So simply put, I'd say the opportunity exists, but we should not take that for granted. Uh, so what was the second question? Uh, no, there's another question on, are there any disadvantages we face in AI-oriented farms? I don't know. That is um, I, I don't know what we mean by, uh, what is meant by AI-oriented farms. Um, um, as with anything, right? AI is a piece of technology. It should be seen as a tool uh, that amplifies human intent. And so it can be used for good things and bad things. And used naively or disingenuously, it can lead to harm. Uh, and so it's really a question of, you know, what do you want to optimize for? Are you optimizing? So you want to optimize for yield, you, but you also want to minimize ecological harm. Uh, uh, and uh, you want to actually be uh, ensure that uh, you're not disabling, uh, disrupting ecosystems in the process by uh, growing non-native things and so on. So all of those have to be, any of these intents can be augmented through AI, but the question is what is the ultimate underlying intent, right? Sure. Uh, and so do we have appropriate checks and balances? Sure. There, there are some quick, uh, very specific questions uh, here. There's one question on, is the AI solution for the child malnutrition you said it, is it in the Rajasthan state also? Uh, that's the question of that. We do, uh, yeah, we're working with multiple state governments um, and uh, Rajasthan is also one of the states we work in. We're working with the state government of Telangana. In fact, uh, that picture of the hospital you saw where uh, the nurse was collecting a video, that's actually Nilafar Hospital okay. in Hyderabad. Uh, it's the largest volume maternity hospital in the country and I think the second largest in Asia. Uh, so we work with multiple states, Telangana, uh, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Rajasthan are some of the states we, we work in. So um, if, uh, when you work in a remote area and there's no connectivity, then how do people share their 
uh, the photographs from of the babies. So. Uh, yeah, there's an implicit assumption that the image has to be shared, right? Um, so these models are being built uh, to be small enough that we can do inference uh, on the device, uh, on device inference, uh, even offline. Um, in fact, the agriculture solution you saw is already deployed in offline mode. And uh, uh, the, the visual weighing machine is one that's still in development, but uh, again, the intent of we're, we're designing those networks to be small enough that they can be compressed uh, to do that. Uh, in the case of, in fact, the pest management solution uh, where we detect pests, uh, we compress the model to be, I don't know, less than a megabyte. Uh, yeah, I think something like two megabytes or something, which is, which is actually smaller than the size of the photograph being clicked by the farmer, right? So we, we, are, we are doing that. And so, it, but it's an important question, which is we right up front consider many of the practical uh, constraints that we have to operate under. Hence also my saying that we don't want this to be a standalone app and then having to have lots of people download this. It should be a feature in existing apps so that when an update of these existing apps go out, at some point this will pop up as a new feature, right? I see another one, which is what are the overall results before and after introducing these AI solutions? Kind of early to tell, um, I mean, as an institute, we are relatively young, we are only three years old. Um, our solution that's furthest along is the one, uh, is a solution in cotton farming. Uh, and uh, we're just doing the impact evaluations of that. Um, I probably shouldn't uh, uh, claim any preliminary numbers yet. We have promising numbers, but I don't want to claim those numbers without some degree of robustness checks and peer review, but certainly leading to improvement in yield for farmers who do use our solution. Uh, for our TB solutions uh, we are not, uh, and uh, the newborn health, they're, they're still in development. They, later this year, they will go into um, field experiments and evaluations. We did, so, uh, for the newborn care solution, we did do a field experiment, uh, early experiments, um, Nilofer Hospital itself to understand performance and we had promising performance but the real test will be in the community setting. Um, our COVID solutions uh, have led to real impact. For example, our work with uh, various uh, city administrations have been widely uh, appreciated. And in fact, they made a real difference in how the city planned for interventions. Okay. Thank you very much, Rahul. Uh, I'm sure a lot more questions and a lot more interaction. And also thank you for all the hard work in a very hard area, making sure that there's real impact. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. It is very fruitful work. And so I invite anyone interested in this sort of work, I invite you to, you know, come spend time with us, come work with us. We, we do internships and we have full time positions we are actively hiring. So do spread the word. Yeah. Rahul, this, on, the reverse, on the reverse, we have plans to engage you with some of the activities that we are planning. Huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. Sounds good. Uh, again, we are, we, are, we are happy to be of help. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Vikram. Thank, thanks a lot, Rahul, for an excellent talk. And also, you know, I hope, as PJ said, you know, I hope you will let us bother us, you know, bother you, you know, in the future to, you know, help us with some of the activities that we are planning as part of this hub. Thank you very much. Yeah. Anytime, anytime. Consider us friends. Thanks. So, um, uh, thank you. So, the next, um, we have a roundtable. Um, you know, if you have an exciting roundtable, uh, you know, where the uh, panelists are Professor Jaydeep Srivastava from uh, University of Minnesota, Dr. Shailesh Kumar from GEO, Dr. Priyam Vada Trivedi from Ashoka University, and uh, Dr. Ashwin Mashinavajala from uh, Duke University. So, Professor Kamal Karlapalam, um, a faculty member at AAA Hyderabad, and uh, he also heads the uh, Data Science and Analytics uh, Research Center at AAA Hyderabad, will uh, take it from here. Thank you, Kamal. So please. Uh, thank you, Deva. Uh, and uh, thank you all for attending this uh, roundtable. So um, uh, this roundtable is about um, uh, you know, the trajectory of uh, uh, data-driven solutions and products over the next 10 years. And what should we do about it now? Because again, uh, if you see, um, as many of the um, keynote speakers have said, data privacy and other issues are uh, important. Uh, so without, uh, um, so uh, the basic idea here is uh, data is important, but it's also an enigma. 
uh, it is filled with a lot of contradictions and there are aspects which about the fairness, bias, privacy, public and proprietary uh, ownership, uh, data-driven products and solutions. So we will focus on the past, present and future of this data and, uh, uh, and, and also concentrate a little bit on the uh, privacy. Um, uh, without uh, further uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, aspects about the, um, uh, about the panel, uh, I invite Professor uh, Jadip Srivastava, who has been uh, a faculty member at the uh, University of Minnesota for uh, um, almost um, uh, 30 years. And uh, uh, he has also been uh, we working with uh, various um, uh, organization uh, companies uh, such as uh, um, uh, um, uh, Amazon, Yordle. Um, uh, he was with Persistent Systems and uh, uh, is currently a co-founder of uh, uh, Ninja Metrics and, in the, and uh, um, uh, was also spent time with Quarter uh, Computing Research uh, Institute where he was a chief scientist. And um, uh, let me see, okay. Okay, start the, yeah. So there is, uh, um, yeah. So uh, this is, uh, I hope you can uh, see the uh, panel. And uh, uh, he's also an IEEE fellow and uh, a uh, very accomplished um, uh, researcher. So, uh, so I have, uh, uh, I, I leave it to uh, Professor Jaydev Srivastava with certain questions um, uh, about uh, computational advertising and uh, data privacy, computer advertising, and next 10 years of computer computational advertising. Uh, in that context, I would like to hear his uh, thoughts. Um, um, okay. Okay. So especially about computational especially advertising. About computational advertising. Um, I was actually um, going to. I was actually well, going I mean, to. Computational well, advertising, I mean, computational is, advertising something that, is something that uh, uh, I think. My I think view on that is that it will continue, continue to go on. Continue to go on. Some issues. Some issues. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Some feedback. Sorry. Some feedback. Sorry. Uh, All right. Can I proceed? Uh, can I proceed? No, there's still feedback. Can there's still can feedback. Can you check? Yeah. If everybody, yeah, if everybody else can easier. mute, it is easier. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Others, yeah. Can so mute. others can mute. Others can mute us. Okay, great. Okay, great. No, still feedback. Okay, now it has stopped. Okay. So I guess computational advertising, I think uh, the things will, are continuing. Um, there's just way too much money in this world that is spent on advertising that will continue to drive it. Uh, so it'll just go on. And the other thing is that uh, advertising actually works. Uh, I think the statement was made long time ago by one of the famous people advertising researchers way back in the 1960s or 70s that we know uh, that half of the advertising money works. We just don't know which half. And then uh, that has been the driving principle. Uh, and you know, with uh, Google as an example or all these online things, we are und understanding better and better and uh, in fact, as, uh, as uh, Kati, uh, Katina's presentation said, that you know, that little company in Melbourne, just from your app usage, it can start, you know, it can figure out what is going on inside your mind to the level of being able to diagnose uh, mental conditions. So I think the technology is already there and, uh, and getting there uh, about understanding, uh, for instance, people have done quite successfully uh, things like understanding people's emotions and moods and so on during these mega advertising events like Super Bowl in the US and then being able to figure out how do you target ads to people. Uh, so for instance, when if their team is doing well, like imagine ma major sporting events, right? IPL, uh, to put it in the Indian context. And uh, when people, your team is doing well, then you're feeling good. And then at that point, there's, uh, in fact, there's a whole psychology theory called mood management theory. And people have started applying to that, that there are certain kind of ads that will appeal to you when you're feeling 
positive and happy and the other kinds of ads will appeal to you when you're feeling sad. So starting, you know, targeting is going to go on. So that whole thing is will continue. Uh, but let me uh, also mention, uh, I mean, healthcare, I was going to say that healthcare is important as an area that of course, but a lot of things have already been made. I think the second area, another area that has good positive potential is what I would say is self-learning, okay, education. So nowadays, especially if we look with all these things like MOOCs and so on, so much of content is available now. The challenge is twofold. One is that, uh, like here's another number. So lots of adoption of MOOC in terms of lots of people start using MOOCs and stuff. But the problem is that on the average, there's only about a seven, six to seven percent completion rate, course completion rate. Now, you know, I'm at the university and many of you are at universities. If you're the class that in which your students registered had only a 7% completion rate, <laughs> you know, immediately that administration will ask, well, how, what are you doing in the class, right? I mean, why, why are 93% people dropping out? So the point is that that metric is very strange. Of course, in the regular class, what happens is there's something called a, the registration fees. You pay a fees. So one thing that is guaranteed is that your major objective is to complete the course and get the credit. How much you want to learn is personalized, but uh, course completion rates will be high. In online courses, especially self-learning, uh, it's not clear that completion rate is the right metric even. So now, uh, so people which has been driven very much by, you know, we need to design courses such that the people will complete them. That may not even be the right metric. Uh, at the same time, so people are coming with all kinds of heterogeneous objectives. Someone is coming to take the course in a regular way. Someone just wants to, you know, they're just preparing for an oral exam. So they just want to skim through everything over a weekend. Someone else wants to just, uh, you know, take a few topics or whatever else it is, right? So the idea is, uh, in fact, one of the things always has been that, oh, completion rate is so low. So that means the course material needs to be, keep people engaged. Well, maybe people are coming with different objectives. So now, of course, uh, the th so there needs to be more help for the learners and there needs to be better guidance to the course designers. And I think that is where a lot of uh, behavioral data that is available about how different people are going through the course and how lots of them have gone through in the past can help us understand ways of building, whether it is recommendation systems or course assistance or whatever else it is, uh, to help create peer groups and all these kind of things for the self learners themselves. And on the other hand, if the uh, instructors can better understand that the course materials that they have designed, how they are uh, being differently used by different groups of people, maybe that can help them design those materials better. For instance, right now we design it in a very linear manner. This topic, then this lecture, then this lecture, this lecture. Maybe the whole set of courses, the course should be designed as just a bunch of modules and the actual navigation through them should be left up to the user, right? Because they're going to navigate differently anyways. So that's one area that I see, okay? Now in the interest of time, I'll take maybe just a couple of more minutes and raise a couple of controversial questions about privacy and we hope to come back in the questions later on. So we have heard about, you know, um, privacy and so on. And clearly, especially when we have a panel on AI, machine learning, these kind of areas or data science, we always see the, the benefits versus the, uh, you know, like the Uber surveillance kind of 1984-ish uh, scenario, okay? Uh, I'll raise a couple of points. So let's say, take some statistics in healthcare. I was talking to a gentleman who till recently used to head the Agency for Health Research and, uh, and Quality in the US, which really looks at, you know, uh, it's a big agency, part of uh, the entire health and human services, whose main goal is to look at what is the overall impact that uh, health research and health care in general is having on the population. And here's an overall, so what, they did a study of like a meta study really, they took all the things they had funded for the last like 40, 50 years, something like that. And they said, let us see what is the overall impact of all of these on people's health. And here's the, rough number, and again, this is, I, I don't have any paper to quote, but this is what the agency director told me. He said, number one, if you look at your health, 
at least now we're talking about the US population. So I don't know how much of it is applicable across, but some of it would be. He said roughly 50% of your healthcare or your health problems depends on your genetics. Okay. So unless we go into gene therapy, there's nothing else is going to happen over there. All right. So it's your fate, if you will. And then he said about 20% is everything that the healthcare system does for you. Okay. So there's still a gap of about 30%. Okay. And that 30%, he said, it's roughly about 20% is how you treat your body. And 10% is how you treat your mind. So what he was meaning was 20% is things like the food, exercise, uh, you know, diet, all these kind of things. Okay. How do you sleep? And 10% is your social stuff leading to mental health issues. Okay. And he said that this 30% gap that we have, so it's a 50% genetics, right? And, and the big initiatives like Human Genome Project really are trying to make a dent in that one. And, uh, you know, it says 20% is what we have done so far. This 30% where it's like 20% is, that's why all these trackers and all these, you know, uh, different kinds of devices, the data collected from that has big promise towards the, all these precision me medicine initiatives. And then another 10% is, uh, you know, the Melton Health. And it was interesting to see that uh, thing called Zafti as an application. Okay. So this is sort of the potential of all these, you could call it privacy invading technologies, uh, the remaining 30%. And that's why at least uh, the US healthcare system is pushing big time in that direction. Okay. And now a couple of other things about privacy. So I'm going to make two main points. One is that let us say, let's look at the WhatsApp versus signal controversy, right? Recently, uh, when Facebook came up with this new privacy invading policy, if you will, people started moving to things like Signal or Telegraph or even Parler and things like that, which are more not, you know, your privacy is more maintained over there. But here's a slightly controversial position. We also saw that those kind of platforms have led to organizing what happened in the US on the 6th of January, right? And I don't know how much role it played in what happened in India, in Delhi on the 26th of January. So the question is that if people in mass start moving towards these unregulated, unmoderated forums, which give you absolute privacy because no one can look at it, it also creates a, a dark corner in the room where all the people who are creating such huge problems, they can congregate and talk about it. No one has any idea of what's going on over there. So it has shown a very dark side or a very dangerous side of these privacy preserving things. Okay. And then the last point, the last point I want to make is that when we come to forums like this, where we, when we start thinking about privacy, then we say privacy is very important. And then we go and live our lives in which we don't really care that much about privacy. Right? So it's almost as if we, we are dual personality. So if you ask someone, is privacy important for you? People will say, yes, of course. But then you ask them the next question that, okay, so are you going to start using Google Maps? Who's going to start using Google Maps? And overall also, I think the, the, the question, the point about the uh, privacy being uh, an issue of society is, is, uh, is you know, is, is very relevant. I mean, for instance, you know, I have lived long enough in two very different societies. And I remember my father was in the railway, so we used to travel in the train all the time. And a train journey is interesting uh, in Indian railways, right? You, you sit over there and people suddenly ask you, okay, so all the, like, okay, so how many children do you have? That's fine. How much money do you make? Okay. In the US, that's not a question you ask. Okay. And I still remember one last story I will say about attitude towards healthcare and this thing. My father used to have diabetes. Okay, which means, you know, 50% genetics, my chances is high as well. But I still remember once, and his younger brother was there. And so my father was so, oh, he came over for tea and he said, oh, I have to take my diabetes medicine, right, metformin. 
And my uncle said, oh, I'm also having, the, maybe give me one tablet as well. So that is, was the attitude towards not just privacy, but like, you know, okay, you're taking this metformin, give me one tablet as well. Now, you know, metformin is not the kind of tablet you want to just say because your brother is taking one, you should take one as well, right? It's not chocolate. So I think the <laughs> general attitude towards privacy and many of these factors are very society dependent. And I think one of the questions that was asked uh, to Rahul was that, does India have an advantage? I think one of the biggest advantages that India has, and for instance, the US does not, is that all the privacy regulations are actually getting in the way for healthcare uh, uh, technology progress in the US. Um, in India, that's not there, but of, you know, the, because the concerning the society and amongst people is not there, but that has its own pluses and minuses. And I will kind of stop Thank here. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Jaydeep. Um, we will um, uh, have the questions uh, after all the panelists have spoken. And now I invite um, uh, Dr. Ashwin Machana Jila Ahala uh, to talk. Uh, he's a associate professor at uh, Duke, and uh, he's been um, he's a graduate from Cornell and has uh, was a um, honorary mentioned in Jim Gray. Uh, PhD thesis award. Uh, he spent uh, time at Yahoo Labs and has been leading this data privacy group at uh, uh, um, Duke and has uh, started his own company, Tumult Labs. And um, I would like him to talk about data availability and privacy and aspects about privacy preserving uh, data systems and uh, cost benefit aspects of between uh, privacy and data. So. Over to you, uh, Ashwin. You're on mute, I think. Oh, we can't hear you, Ashwin. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. Okay, sorry. Hi, uh, thanks for inviting me to this uh, to this event. It's a great discussion. Um, I'm gonna maybe quickly share a few slides and then um, speak for a few minutes. Um, so we did talk about privacy did come up already and uh, I'll address those maybe in the question answer session. Those are very sort of intriguing questions that Professor Jaydeep uh, raised. But now I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of privacy preserving AI and machine learning and data science. And so what we're seeing today is like data is being siloed, as, as Professor Jaydeep said, in many cases because people are worried that by using the data, they're going to sort of breach the privacy of individuals, or they're actually shared using techniques that are all vulnerable to increasingly sophisticated attacks. And I'll talk a little bit about those attacks in a, in a second. And so what some organizations are doing is they're turning to sort of modern mathematically rigorous privacy standards and one such standard is differential privacy. Um, and these modern privacy approaches actually have the potential to not to sort of lay barriers for privacy, but rather increase access to data in a safe manner. Um, and, but at the same time, they may require the require changes in how we access or analyze sensitive data. Okay, so in the next sort of uh, seven minutes or so, I'll quickly go over the three points and then and then I will take questions in the question answer session. So I don't need to preach the choir, but everyone has a ton of data. A lot of it is very sensitive and sometimes people are not able to either use that data or share that data with external parties. So hospitals can't necessarily take their data, raw data and share it with another hospital or share it with a, with a researcher because you, for example, may not want someone to know precisely when you went to the doctor and what kind of diseases you have, what kind of diagnosis you have and so on, right? Um, same with the social media posts, same with government agencies, same with financial section, sector, right? However, even if these data are released in sort of high level aggregated form, there are attacks that, that have become more and more prevalent and sophisticated. 10 years ago, people thought, yes, privacy is an issue, but you know, who cares about it? But today, like 
like you know, there have been so many sort of attacks both in the academia and in the and in the real world where sort of seemingly innocuous ways of sharing data can be sort of you can take that and reconstruct the underlying database. And I'm going to give you some examples uh, in the next few slides. So the first thing is like there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people who say yes I'm going to take my data I'm going to anonymize it by removing sort of identifiers and releasing that data and that's safe. And so that has been known for over 20 years now that that is not, there is no concept of, there's nothing called anonymized data. Nothing is safe because you can sort of remove your identifiers, but there's a lot of other behavioral data or sort of uh, movie rating data or genome data that can uniquely identify you and can tell sort of very sensitive information about you. Next people say, well, let's not release the data, let's release machine learning models. So I'll take my sensitive data, be, be it health data, be it sort of email data, be it, um, uh, user activity data on, on social media. And rather than releasing the data, I'll, I'll create the train models on it and then send these models out to people, right? It turns out this is not safe too because these machine learning models are pretty big. They have millions of parameters. And in fact, there is recent research where, uh, which shows that if a machine learning model has to have high accuracy, it necessarily needs to memorize uh, certain parts of the training data. This leads to things like membership attacks where you can figure out whether a person was in the training data set or not. This also leads to like um, uh, worries which are, which are true that if you have like large language models which are fit on say emails, you will actually memorize passages from the email and therefore it can sort of, sort of complete uh, you know, social security numbers or birth dates or exactly what you were doing at a certain point of time and so on and this is not, this is this is a comic, but it's actually true. <laughs> okay, um, and of course, like then, then people say, okay, maybe machine learning models are too detailed. Maybe we only release aggregate statistics. And a lot of government agencies, a lot of medical institutions, release aggregate statistics about their operations, about people, about patients, um, about about transactions, right? And so it turns out even aggregate statistics can help reconstruct the underlying database. And this is. A true story, like the US Census Bureau, which is like any Census Bureau in the world, collects data from individuals and it has to, it has a sort of legal re responsibility to maintain the privacy of these things. So it does a lot of work in trying to ensure that whatever data it releases stays sort of private. It is, you cannot just sort of reconstruct individuals. But, it, but the, they took the data they released in 2010, which was like aggregate statistics of people, their households they live in, and which locations, which sort of regions they live in, and so on. It's not individual level, it's aggregate. But using just these aggregates, they were able to reconstruct more than 45% of the US population's records, which is several hundreds of millions of people, exactly just based on the statistics that they had released. And if the US Census Bureau can do it, so can anybody. Um, and these algorithms are very simple. You could write them in Python. You could, all you need is like just open source Python libraries. You don't need supercomputers. You can, you can rent a couple of machines on Amazon EC2 and you can run these algorithms, right? And so, and what it basically sort of points to is, is a fundamental sort of uh, law that if you release too much information about your database, you can, you risk basically giving away the entire database to someone. And this is just a fundamental fact of nature. Right, and so therefore, sort of organizations are turning to sort of more modern ways of sort of safeguarding privacy. Like, for example, differential privacy is a way to do that, where you can learn sort of aggregate statistics about the data or learn machine learning models of the data without revealing sort of individual level uh, individual level inputs. And a lot of big big tech companies are sort of moving to this. The U.S. Census Bureau is releasing the 2020 U.S. Decennial Census results based off this. And, uh, and there's a sort of push towards using these more modern techniques. And the nice thing about this is like, you can now share sort of not individual level data, but aggregate statistics, which is usually what people want in a safe manner. And hopefully this will allow sort of freer flow of, of data. So what is this differential privacy? And maybe I'll say a few things about differential privacy and like what its consequences are and maybe where the next set of problems arise. Um, so differential privacy is a rigorous standard expressed in math. It's, um, it's not an algorithm. You can, you can devise algorithms that either analyze your data or learn models or make releases that satisfy, and it can, these algorithms can satisfy differential privacy. And usually you to meet the standard, you have to take your data analysis pipeline 
and then modify it by say adding noise or, or doing some sort of uh, randomized step. And for most analysis or release algorithms, differentially right algorithms are known already. The, the literature is vast. And there are sort of two um, user-friendly tools, there are startups, there are, there's a lot of activity on making differential pricing more accessible to, to both the industry and academia and people. And the, and the critical thing here is like these differential right algorithms allow you to sort of track how much privacy is lost in a very precise and quantifiable way, which basically was not there till now. And that's what is sort of revolutionizing this, this, this sort of way of doing private data analysis. Um, and so, so this raises some interesting questions. So one interesting question is this sort of social choice problem, which is how do you trade off privacy protection for like how much utility you can get from your data? Because you can basically get, have two extremes, right? One extreme is you can just give away the data, you have no privacy, but you have a lot of utility there. On the other end of the spectrum, you have basically, you don't give anything of the data and then you lose all the utility. So it's like there are two ends of the spectrum, but then you can, now this differential privacy has this parameter epsilon that allows you to track this entire spectrum but there is a social choice problem of how do you trade this off and where do you set your privacy preferences? And this is a social choice problem. A technologist cannot solve this, but given the application and given what's the use of the data, there are sort of so, uh, preferences that tell you what is the preference for privacy versus what is the preference for, for accuracy or utility in the data. Another sort of fundamental change uh, that differential privacy and privacy, any, any right way of doing privacy ap applies is that every time you make a release or every time you use the data, you have to lose some privacy. Somebody in the data set or some subset of data, people in the data set has to lose some amount of privacy. And so therefore this privacy loss adds up across multiple releases. And the nice thing about differential privacy is that you can actually account it. But essentially what this sort of forces you to think about is like things of date, you, you, have, to, you have to think of access to data or privacy, which is equivalent as a finite resource. And we've been thinking about access to data as an infinite resource. We just take data and then use it over and over again, which actually causes a lot of problems. Like one of the biggest problems is like uh, is like false discovery or p-hacking or or doing machine learning overfitting. All of this are 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 because you think of data as an infinite resource and you can use it over and over and over again, right? And so one sort of side effect of thinking thinking, designing your system with privacy is that you think of data as a finite resource where you can only make finite number of questions to it, which has other sort of positive side effects in terms of making sure that you're doing things the right way and not overfitting or doing false discoveries. And the last point I want to say is that another consequence of differential privacy is that, or any privacy technique is that it works by redacting some information. So either you're hiding some information or suppressing some information or adding noise um, and the goal is because you want to learn about aggregate statistics and not about individuals. But the consequence to that is basically now you have a new social choice problem because, because by redacting some information, you may be disadvantaging some populations. Like for example, like there was this, uh, the US Census Bureau, for example, released their initial algorithm they were going to use for a part of the decennial census. And they realized that like the, the they were sort of suppressing some small counts to ensure privacy. And so it made some small towns disappear. Later they have fixed this problem, but essentially now you have this sort of, you have to make this choice between different sort of algorithms for data analysis, some of which may have greater overall accuracy, but more inequality, whereas others which may have less overall accuracy, but more equality. And this is not just for differential privacy or privacy algorithms. This is true for machine learning too, right? Anytime you're taking very detailed data and trying to sort of aggregate it or learn some higher level model, you have this social choice problem of accuracy disparity versus accuracy. And, and a lot of the machine learning fairness and bias uh, work can be also fit in the same, same space here. And the last point, again, again, this is also true for machine learning is like, whenever you're using like a privacy mechanism, privacy mechanism is going to introduce some artifacts into this data set. Um, like in this example, this privacy mechanism is doing something crazy where it's it's measuring blobs of data rather than measuring each individual fine, fine grained cell. And then you get these sort of uniform regions and arguably it's not, not a very good algorithm, right? But, but, it, but essentially like you can't just take the output of this, of this algorithm and just say, I'm just going to use it as though it's real data, right? 
a lot of a lot of companies for example say oh we're going to de deliver synthetic data to you you can just use as uh, as though it's real data but these data sets will have some sort of art artifacts in them and you cannot be looking at them as real data you need to sort of really think hard about is this data is this sort of artifact coming from the mechanism or is it data coming from the real data and so so we need more rigorous methods to sort of reason about the artifacts introduced by privacy algorithms and the nice thing is that modern privacy methods give us a language to discuss and analyze this. So that's that's what I want to talk about, and then we can discuss other things uh, in the QA. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ashwin. And um, uh, our um, next panelist um, is uh, Dr. PM Wada Trivedi. Uh, she's a, a, a associate director at uh, uh, Trivedi Center for Political Data. She has a PhD from uh, uh, um, University of Michigan in political science and uh, um, has been working on many data related projects. She is a recipient of uh, uh, the Rakham Postdoctoral Fellowship uh, and is involved in various research grants. Um, and her current uh, um, uh, work is on cost of contention uh, and uh, uh, conflict related issues. I would, uh, she is going to give the perspective from humanities and social sciences, data collection management, and uh, data services and data products. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor. Can you see my screen and hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you can see it. You can actually put it on screen, full screen, and then it will be good. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, just um, I'll... Yeah, it's visible uh, and it looks good. Yeah, okay. Okay, all right. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank Professor Kamal for including me as a part of this uh, as a part of this panel. Um, there's some issue, these are some of the issues that I've been working on and thinking about for a very long time. Um, however, it might be slightly different from what has been spoken about so far, because essentially, there's some, I mean, some of the questions that will come up, uh, I'm just trying to find a common theme to it. And what I have to talk about is, actually, it's about just the everyday process of building data sets, which is not as glamorous. It's, it's extremely mundane, it's tedious, and it could even, even be boring. However, that does introduce the importance of these, of these small tasks for, I mean, anyone who has worked on data, data generation, they know it's, it's not a trivial task. Um, I will just focus on two points for now. And if something does come up in the q and I will try and address it. Um, okay. All right. So I would like to focus on two key points, like I said, uh, the role of personnel, which is students and staff, students, including undergraduate students and graduate students who work with us on projects and the staff that we are is that we hire. Um, to help us execute the projects. And the processes behind um, the final data set that we like to download, it's in neat tables and then analyze. I think there's, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes that I think is not spoken about much and as a result is taken for granted. But I think those of us, I guess maybe especially in India, we, we struggle quite a lot in establishing processes and protocols for any kind of data dissemination and especially public data sets. All right. So I'm, I mean, I'm at Ashoka and we are a university setting. So we do work a lot with a lot with students. We do have uh, both undergraduate and graduate students and project staff who've graduated from different colleges that we, that we hire. Um, Okay, so there, there are three things that I think that are extremely important when we work with students and which is again, extremely important in terms of the kind of ecosystem that we will build and that we'll perhaps see in a decade from now. Um, so these are the three things that I wanted to talk about. It's uh, training, mentorship and incentives. Uh, training students, 
is again extremely time consuming and depending on the kind of softwares we use whether it's excel or r uh, we do need to spend time with students in terms of okay how do we use it are, we, are they using it well checking the work and just a lot of back and fro which takes up quite a bit of time but it is very important in terms of the quality of data that is produced at the end um mentorship i i think when we work with students and staff it's i think you need to have conversations which go beyond work it we can't see them just as a means to an end i think most of the people who work with us they have questions of their own and it becomes extremely important to also encourage that part because at least i mean in my in my extremely limited experience i have seen that kind of encourages an ownership of work and when we tend to make something that is our own i think we give it we give it our best and once again i really cannot stress the importance of making these extremely tedious mundane tasks and doing it really well um and the last is last one is incentives um some of us do have access to research money and and i know funding in general is an issue and i mean there there are much more senior people in the in the room here who can speak about just funding for social science research in india because it's it's not easy to come by but at least those of us who have resources we should try to provide some amount of stipend even if it's nominal or or course credits of some some sort um the next is co-authorship and i i don't quite know why why this this is common but those who work on data i've usually seen either they're not acknowledged at all in papers or news articles or if they are they just put in acknowledgments and i'm not sure why that's the case why can't they be co-authors even if it was writing scripts to clean names of politicians or constituencies i do think that is important for them to be listed as co-authors and especially in the social sciences i'm i'm sorry to say this but i don't think we have a good protocol about who should be a co-author and who's not um i have worked on a limited number of papers but i mostly been working i mostly worked on the data part of it but i've been a co-author on all those papers so i think the data and the idea are equally important so it's important that those who work on the data and the methods should be included as co-authors um and the last one is related to the first two in a way we do need to encourage students and research staff to start their own projects of course it gives a sense of ownership but again the kind of training and mentorship we provide them in process in the process is going to help us build build a research community here which we i mean i think it's it's it is beginning to see some element of it but there's there's a lot of work to be done and we do need a huge research community to answer a whole host of questions we have i mean regardless of whether it's sociology political science economics i don't think the subject quite matters as much as just building a strong foundation for any kind of social research um the second point is about the role of processes um i think i'm perhaps a bit too paranoid about the role of documentation in building any data set but i think it's common to you know get csv files or excel files with no associated documentation and what what is it that i exactly mean by documentation um what are the sources used i mean there some of us who work on uh, building data sets using newspapers are the newspapers mentioned if the newspapers are mentioned where did we where did we get the archives from do we have every day of every month of all the years we claim that the data set represents again small things but extremely important because we use these data sets essentially to find out things about the world to build knowledge but if the data set has gaps and we don't know it we can't we cannot extrapolate we cannot generalize the serious limitations and those limitations need to be uh, need to be given up up front um a detailed description of methodologies used and i would like to just avoid the the distinction between qualitative and quantitative methodologies because i i honestly think it does more harm than good 
I think any method that any one of us uses should be in the service of the questions, but we should be extremely clear about what processes did we use to extract the data, either it's from newspapers, either it's from PDFs. Um, at DCPD, we work a lot with statistical reports that are published by the Election Commission. So can we describe the process that we use to extract the data from the PDF into log Taba. So that's the portal that you can that you can view all these election results on. So step A to step Z, everything needs to be listed. The scripts that have been used to make that possible need to be in the public domain. I mean, especially if we claim we are building public data sets, it doesn't make sense if we don't release these scripts. Um, a clear description of the variables. So this is the information that we extract from data sets. Um, what do they mean? Um, what, what are their limitations? What are the values that they represent? Some of some value, some variables will be numeric, some will be text. But again, this, this needs to be upfront instead of the user trying to decipher what the CSV file means. Because I mean, especially if you want to encourage research, we need to make this as friendly, we need to make this process as friendly as possible. Um, the second point is about data dissemination. And this might be a slightly thorny issue um, because I know quite a few people, both in India and outside, who talk about sharing the data. And it's only over time I realized that they're talking about others sharing their data and not they sharing their data. So I think people need to walk their talk. If you're talking about data sharing, you need to start releasing the data you're sitting on. You can't expect others to do the work for you. And then, you know, you just build, you just build up that. I think everybody needs to contribute to this. We need to get feedback on data quality. And this is, this is tricky in the sense, how do we design interesting ways where people can use our data and also give us feedback on how to improve it. So one way is organizing workshops that create awareness about the data you use. So once again, because um, at TCPD, we do work at, we work with electoral data. So we try to, I mean, yes, use the data with students and classes, but also with journalists. So that way, if we want journalists to be consuming and using this data in their pieces, we need to know what is it that they find useful instead of us assuming that this is useful. So that, that kind of feedback is important. Um, it's difficult and it's not easy to establish these relationships. But again, if we are talking about a decade or two, I, I do think it is possible. And the, and the last point is um, about just reviewing the data sets that we are releasing, that we are building. Um, this is mainly a housekeeping task that I learned from one of my mentors is we just we need to perform just sanity checks on the data because no data is perfect. Humans have worked on it. Humans are prone to errors. There must be some error in the data. For example, is there a missing district? Is there a missing constituency or missing village? Just depending on the kind of data that you're looking. And if it is so, why is that the case? Do, do we need to go back to the scripts that are used? So just maybe you know twice a year performing some kind of sanity checks is the data as good as we think as we think it is. Okay. So I, again, once again, just given the previous few uh, presentations and talks, I, I didn't want this to be completely about the everyday and mundane. So I just wanted to give a few examples of what I think is possible um, and what I, what I would like to see. So we know that the Indian census is conducted every 10 years. Um, but we don't have a time series of all the censuses post independence. I mean, we, there were census even conducted before independence, but you will not see a time series data set post independence. You see it in the case of the US. I mean, yes, they have a lot more resources than us, but, but we don't have the same. So we are unable to see trends over time, uh, population of villages changing, rural to urban, all of this is possible. And this data does exist, except it's scattered across the country. And we don't know the kind of format. Well, we know the kind of format. It does exist in books. So we need to digitize the books, perform OCR and extract. And you can see that this is not a one person or a two person effort. It requires 
like a community effort to build something like this. Um, then just looking at land use, land change, we, we have satellite imagery, we have uh, yearly and even daily satellite imagery, depending on the kind of satellite you're talking about. But if we can build a time series data set of um, satellite images that look at land use, land change, I think we can at least have healthy debates about problems associated with climate change. Um, and the last example is, is my favorite example, is if we can have archives of both English and regional newspapers, because we know English newspapers only focus on, on a certain section, on a certain sliver of reality. If we can use these newspapers, and also there are automated ways of extracting this information, but who is protesting? What are the claims that people have? Civil society, different organization, what top tactics do they use, and how does the government respond? And how, has, how have these changed over space and time? Um, one of the things that we see is like, we see images of let's say police using force, but does police always use force or do they use force only on, under certain circumstances? Right now we can't say that because we don't have a systematic, a rigorous data set that's, that's in place to address these questions. We, I mean, we have experts who have, you know, who observed history, who studied history, who can tell us. I just think we can do it better. We can do it empirically. We can do it systematically. So, just to end, I just want to show you this image. So, this is actually half a page from. It's a picture of half a page from a census that was conducted in 1947 of all settlements in India. And I found this with a, with a colleague of mine in um, the Punjab State Archives in Chandigarh. So again, this goes back to this question of mine, just having a time series of Indian census at the village level, I mean, I, I, while it's extremely cool, I think it'll also help us address very important questions about demographic changes in the country. We know they're contentious, but can we go beyond the contention? So uh, the issue with this is, um, I mean, you can see we're already on page 746. Um, there were two volumes of this, and during partition, one was taken to Pakistan. This is what the librarians told us. So again, I think building any data set in social science is a non-trivial task. And while this would have been extremely cool, interesting, however you want to think of it to do, the thing is we really can't use this for now unless we also get the other volume because we only have it till a certain certain length or we don't, we don't have the entire thing. And each volume is about 800 to 900 pages with the longitude and latitude of every settlement in India. So if we have this and then we build a data set over time using the Indian census, we merge that, we can see which settlements have disappeared, which have merged, which have, uh, which have been split up, which have become from villages to cities. So there's, there's a lot that we can, we can examine if we have such, such rich data. But um, there's no reason to despair because we do still have a lot of other questions that we can answer given that there's no dearth of data. It's mainly how do we use the resources that are at our disposal. Um, and just in conclusion, these are just two points that I would like to re reiterate. Um, high quality data generation is contingent on a healthy ecosystem and a healthy ecosystem values the people involved. And I think while a focus on data is important, but so is a focus on the, on the people who help generate that data. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Premwada. And uh, um, we will take up questions during the Q&A session. Um, I next have uh, uh, Dr. Shailesh Kumar. He um, uh, is the chief uh, uh, data scientist and uh, uh, um, leads the Center for Excellence in AI and ML at GEO. Uh, he has been associated with uh, 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 Indian School of Business and IIIT Hyderabad. Uh, he has been the vice president of Ola and uh, a co-founder at Third Leap. He, he did his uh, PhD from uh, University of Texas at Austin uh, and worked with Microsoft and Google. 
Um, without further ado, I'll give it to Dr. Shailesh and ask him also to uh, talk about uh, uh, these complex systems and uh, the role of uh, customer and business. He's leading the GOAI team, so uh, customers, business, and uh, the data issues. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Kamal. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So what I'll do is I'll talk about four themes which are kind of important for the future of AI in the next 10 years. I'll touch uh, less on privacy issues, more on AI issues, but uh, and product issues. Right? So the first theme I want to talk about is this idea of emergent intelligence as opposed to uh, programmed intelligence, and especially in the context of complex systems. So. So just to give a sense of how uh, you know products, the idea of products are evolving, right? So we have been talking about programmed intelligence in certain products uh, where you know they are IT driven and they are programmed, right? So the rules of the game are programmed into them and they just work. Uh, then we have uh, crowdsource intelligence with lots of data coming in, and this is where if we have enough data, then you know we are mixing it all up and privacy is not a big deal if we deal with the data as a collective. And very beautiful technologies have come out of uh, this kind of a data. Uh, the third generation product, which is the next 10 years, uh, is going to be, in my view, something like a smart city or uh, you know other such examples. But the key element there is the AI in such complex systems is going to be very different than what we have built so far, right? So Google is a six API system. Uh, a smart city is a thousand API system, right? And, and the kind of AI thinking we are going to need in the future is going to be very different than what we have been doing so far. So we have been doing what, what we may call bottom-up AI, and now we have to do something different. And these complex ecosystems is what the next generation products are and we need to start preparing ourselves for what that means, what is the architecture and how are we going to deal with that kind of thing. So these systems will have lots of sensors, lots of interactions happening, lots of data generated, lots of AI needed, lots of operations on the ground happening, lots of metrics, right? So that is kind of the characteristic of these systems. So smart cities, you know, uh, telecom itself is a very complex system with lots of towers and customers and devices and all of that. Uh, a refinery, for example, is a very complex system with lots of different units interacting with each other in a very complex way. Agriculture as an ecosystem for the country, not one drone. The whole agriculture ecosystem of a country, supply chain, production, satellite data, IoT data, again, is a very complex system. Healthcare, you know, again, for the whole country, we saw, you know, how uh, during COVID, we found a lot of gaps in our ecosystem. And, you know, how do we integrate data across customers, across different sensor types? And, you know, uh, one of the previous speaker talked about 50% genomics and all that. So how do we build an integrated healthcare ecosystem or a new, you know, e-commerce system, right? So these are all examples of the next generation ecosystem products that are evolving. And, uh, you know, we are going to need a different kind of thinking, uh, both at the IT level and at the AI level to deal with such complex systems, right? Uh, what are the characteristics of these? Uh, you know, they have billions of entities and of different types, right? Customers, people, devices, sensors, facilities, content, or applications, all of that. They have trillions of what we call interactions happening all the time. So if I just take telecom, for example, phone calls are happening, you know, data is being consumed here and there, uh, customer complaints are happening, payments are happening, people on the ground are doing stuff with the towers. All this is happening asynchronously and all the time. How do you manage something as complex as that, right? Uh, there are going to be hundreds of metrics to deal with. So if I just think about Google search, there is one metric or two metrics they may want to deal with, right? If LinkedIn is trying to optimize its uh, you know, neighborhood completion, there are only a few metrics they have to deal with. But in a complex system, we may have metrics for every entity, operational metrics, process and business metrics, environmental and societal metrics. And these are not just independent metrics, they kind of are connected to each other. So how do we think about metrics in this system? And then, you know, millions of decisions the system is going to be taking of all kinds. You know, how to do search better, how to do 
delivery better, how to do you know supply chain better, all kinds of decisions, and they are all again connected decisions. They are not independent of each other. Uh, and then lots of workflows are going to be involved in these, right? There are traditional uh, organic workflows that will have to be there. There are opportunity workflows on how to grow the business uh, and find new use cases. And there are exception workflows that are going to tell us what to do if something breaks down, right? So, so this is kind of my definition of what a complex ecosystem product of the future is going to be. And we at Geo are constantly working on how to think about uh, an AI plus an IT architecture that can handle this kind of complexity. Yeah? So that is one theme. Now, the second theme I want to talk about, especially in the AI world is today we are practicing uh, AI in a very, you know, like seven blind men kind of a way. So, you know, over a period of 20 years, I have seen uh, different kinds of systems. And now we have a fairly good idea of what an AI stack should look like. Uh, like we have a stack in the networking world, we have a physical layer, this layer, this layer, and all that. Is there a similar stack in AI, right? And this is another kind of AI thinking that uh, is going to come up. And we're going to think more holistically about AI rather than one, one kind of a model, right? Uh, and all that. So let me just quickly go through that. So this is my layer zero, which is a digitization of all data has to happen. And the previous speaker uh, showed a image of something, how do you digitize such data? And then the layers start. So one is the interpretation layer, which converts uh, low level data like images, videos, uh, you know, speech, text, genomic sequences into higher level semantics. That is one layer. Uh, and a lot of AI today is happening only in this layer, which is how do we convert all kinds of data into a meaningful uh, data, whether it is X-ray detection, fashion AI, or what have you. So that is one layer, interpretation layer. The next layer is causality because these complex systems are going to need us to think about what caused what. Like if, if you talk about healthcare, uh, one of the speakers talked about the different causes of a health. And we cannot solve health holistically if we don't understand complete causality. So there's going to be a lot of emphasis on complete causality thinking, deep causality thinking. It's not just you know eight, X to Y, it is X to Y to Z to W and how do you think about deep causality? Then prediction, we all understand, uh, you know, uh, and then obviously explanation and explainability will play a major role, both for privacy and fairness reasons, but also for the next layers, because unless I can explain my prediction, I cannot decide what action to do. So explanation layer is very important and the technology is there. Now we are going to not just give an output from a model, we'll also give a reason code and together is going to be considered a complete output of any model. And it'll be used both in uh, fairness, privacy, as well as the next layer. The next layer in my mind is what I call a controllability layer, which says, how do you break the data input into observable and controllable? And there are always observable and controllable uh, variables and uh, breaking that down is very important. Uh, and then we'll have a simulation layer and, and this layer is going to help us do what if analysis and root cause analysis. And one of the biggest challenges in complex system, which have deep causality is, is to figure out what the root cause is, right? And I'll give an example of that in a minute, but that is becoming a bigger problem now in how to do a complex system. And once we are able to do simulation, we are going to have an integrated optimization layer that says for a given input and a an desired output, what should be the control variables? And how do you optimize for that? is going to be an optimization layer. And finally, there is going to be an adaptation, adaptation layer, which will say, hey, inputs have changed. Uh, you better redo your calibration and re-optimize the whole system, right? Now, this is a, I think this is a very universal diagram, which can be used across all complex system, whether we are building smart cities or agriculture for India or healthcare or, uh, or retail or telecom, right? So this kind of a system can work in, uh, but this is the kind of thinking we are going to need. And currently we only focus on, you know, something here, something there, something there in silos. So somebody is an optimization expert, somebody is a vision expert, somebody is a simulation expert, but all of us will have to come together to put together an end-to-end -end architecture. So let me just give a few examples of what, you know, uh, we talk about deep learning. I just want to give an example of deep causality, right? 
so for example in ola uber world if you think about you know what incentives we give to drivers what is the organic demand what are the offers we are giving to customers so these are one set of actions and and metrics this can lead to you know supply demand variations in the in the city which can lead to availability stock out pricing utilization metrics uh, of ola which can further lead to customer experiences of fulfillment conversion experience you know uh, customer experience and efficiency of the operations which can further lead to business objectives like engagement arpu churn revenue cost which can further lead to market share and profitability right so so understanding this deep structure of metrics is going to become more and more important because we are not just optimizing the ctr for a search engine anymore we are optimizing many many metrics and they are combined and you know uh, they are cause and effect of each other so this kind of thinking is going to be needed uh, deep control this is another area that uh, is going to become very important uh, and let me just give an example from telecom so uh, we are going to need an architecture for ai and here is an example of what it means right uh, individual models are not enough we need an architecture of ai so let's say i have a churn prediction model that says behavior and usage are observable variables uh, uh, and call drop quality and throughput are controllable variables so the color coding but then we say oh these customers are churning because of high call drops then we go to the previous model and say why the call drops are high again that model is going to give me explanation for you know the network load outdoor indoor and devices coverage and interference Uh, and again i go back further and say let me predict the coverage and interference based on how the towers are placed so you see the the end to end thinking around you know uh, operations on the network side to experience on the customer side has to be integrated and stitched together throughout through an architecture of what i call deep control and deep simulation and and uh, all that so this is another level of thinking that we are going to need in the future products the third theme i want to quickly touch upon is the next generation products and uh, you know we have seen some of this with badwani ai and others so the idea here is we are going to now build we have already built individual models to do individual things so we can we can do like you know image recognition handwriting recognition we can build systems to you know understand a student uh, and what kind of things he knows and all that we can build personalization engines for curriculum content problem and solution personalization and we can meet these systems very uh, human like through speech conversation gesture and emotion recognition now all these technologies are available 80% accuracy and now the next generation product innovation will be integrating these uh, these technologies to transform the way we learn and teach the way we do agriculture the way we do healthcare i think bringing of technologies together is a theme to build complex systems like this right so there will be people who will continue to improve speech and gesture recognition but there will be people who will innovate at this level uh, you know another example if you want to build a farmer chatbot which is very contextual and all of that which works in all indian languages we are going to need you know lots of different capabilities coming together speech to text text to intent knowledge graph satellite data weather data soil iot um, uh, and intelligence and reasoning and personalization to give back information content or action right so this kind of a, a complex system thinking is going to become more and more uh, uh, prevalent and the last theme that i want to talk about is that there is no single entity who can do this now right so all of us will have to come together and the idea is if we want to think about different sectors each sector is going to have different beneficiaries each beneficiary is going to need a lot of applications and products and each product is going to need a lot of different services and within ai there are going to be many many services the question is who is going to build these services are they going to be owned by only the googles of the world or can everybody participate in this and this this is a very important theme because unless we allow a, a, an ecosystem where researchers educational institutions startups freelancers and students can also participate and say look i have a very good you know speech to text model in telugu and i want to upload this into a system and every consumer whether it is ola uber or oyo can consume it in their app now right so this kind of bringing together of customers and producers 
of AI is going to happen in the near future because that is the kind of the, the number of APIs we need is, is thousands of them. And there's no single place where all this is available. And today product developers are having very hard time, uh, you know, uh, doing this. So I think uh, this is another theme that, that I think is going to uh, happen. So I'll stop here and then we'll take questions. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Shailesh. And uh, um, there have been a few questions, and uh, um, I will uh, um, go with uh, some of them. Um, the, there are a couple of questions for uh, um, uh, Professor Jaydeep. Uh, one is uh, with respect to uh, this um, um, uh, signal and uh, uh, telegraph and all that. Uh, there is this dark world which has always been existing in the world. There is a dark web, and there is uh, um, uh, you know areas where uh, uh, people would uh, it would be very difficult to penetrate. In those kinds of cases, uh, the, there is always a trade-off between uh, uh, the policing versus uh, the individual freedom. How do you uh, address uh, that um, uh, in that context? Right. Okay. So actually, um, I was tracking these questions, and uh, in fact. Uh, Professor PK, uh, who is in the audience, he actually posted a, a link with, to a copy of his report in which he has analyzed uh, an open platform like Twitter versus, I think, Parler or something, or Signal, one of these. Um, um, and I think one of the points he, in fact, the group actually collected data right now, and I guess it's amazing. Within three weeks, they even have a research report there. And I think what he points out is actually the conjecture that I was making. Uh, in fact, at the end of his, I read just his abstract. The point he makes is that in a platform like Twitter, which people, you know, people can look at and have all kinds of access to, um, and I guess it can be monitored. Uh, there is the 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 amount of fake information was much lesser compared to a closed one. Okay. So I think uh, that kind of goes to the point that uh, in unmonitored, again, I, I will take the analogy that let us say there's a room in which one corner is lighted and one corner is dark, okay? Uh, it becomes very difficult or impossible to understand what is happening in the corner that is dark. So my point only was about having to shed light in all corners, okay? So that was the point. Now, of course, then the question is that uh, there is the other side that was painted the picture of you know the Uber surveillance that was pointed out at the at the top of this this whole meeting, so there's clearly a a balance right. Uh, in fact, let's you know uh, Professor Katina she's not here right now but she talked about Aadhaar right as a good example. Um, now Aadhaar of course as everyone knows has a lot of benefits but also also has a lot of potential for abuse. And I think uh, we always have to constantly keep looking at the trade-offs, which Ashwin pointed out in his nice graph, uh, that uh, you know it's always is a, is a uh, there's obvious benefits and there's potential for abuse. So we always have to keep uh, keep that in mind. And uh, lots of benefits have been pointed out in these in all the presentations, as well as you know the privacy issues and the potential for uh, uh, danger. Uh, my own view is a little bit more slightly fatalistic about it, that people don't really seem to care as much. And uh, once I remember talking to one, uh, one of the data science heads at Facebook a few years ago, I asked him the question, what is Facebook's view of privacy? And he said, we always want to be just a little bit on this side of the ever receding frontier of privacy. So all these words are important. So this is want to be a little bit on this side, okay? So legally they don't uh, step over the bounds and therefore get into trouble. But even the privacy frontier is ever receding. Uh, people don't, you know, what, for instance, you know, my, my parents' generation would not even think about using credit card. Uh, when I grew up, I was not using credit cards and I started using credit cards. And then people were like, well, I don't want to feel, I don't feel comfortable giving my credit card number over the internet. Now people are using mobile payment. 
So I think that uh, what I'm saying is that we have to keep that factor in mind as well, that people's attitudes and the trade-offs will keep changing accordingly. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a question to, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Shailesh and also to uh, JD, uh, the AI uh, aspect. Um, there, is a, um, uh, there is a fear that uh, there is um, some kind of a labeling that can be done to the general public. So, for example, if you look in the education and if you look at MOOC, by AI system can say this person is a poor reader or a, does not understand these concepts or has these deficiencies or uh, this particular patient has these characteristics. So there is a notion of uh, negative labeling that can happen uh, to individuals or groups and that can give rise to a lot of um, pain. And uh, how does democratization of AI and this, uh, uh, you know, either you and Shailesh could answer, handle this labeling of individuals or groups? Like Proud Boys, for example, you know. So Shailesh, why don't you go ahead? I already yeah, yeah. am uh, hogging too much of space. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, uh, you know, a broad, uh, broad uh, uh, way of looking at privacy, right? So if the person who knows your identity does not know your behavior and vice versa, right? So if you can decouple identity from behavior, then privacy is preserved. That's my broad definition of how to think about privacy. So a very good example is you go to the hotel and you present all your identity cards to your front desk and he knows your identity very well, right? But when you go to your room, you know, what you do there, what you eat, what you, you know, watch on TV, whatever you do is private. Nobody knows that behavior. And, you know, the person who is in the front desk knows your identity, but he doesn't know your behavior. So we are never going to have a situation where we can completely decouple the two. And as long as we can do this, which is decouple identity from behavior through technology, through new frameworks like Dr. Ashwin talked about and others, I think it is possible to make that system nice and clean. Yeah, it is, it is not uh, that we cannot have privacy and cannot have progress at the same time. So it is possible. Now, uh, one, of the, one of the things, one of the other uh, silos we need to create, right? If I have a ed tech company and I know enough about a student, uh, first of all, I should never be able to say who the student is. I should only have an ID. I should never have a notion that this is you know, so-and-so student and this is the address and all, we decouple that, right? So that is one part. Second part is when this student goes for a job or a college admission, the data that we have collected about this student inside the EdTech app can never be used for any other purpose other than this. It can never be used. It is illegal. And that EdTech app has to go to jail if they reveal that data to let's say college admissions or others, right? So I think if we create proper regulation frameworks around the proper use of data and agreed upon by the user and cannot be shared across silos, then first of all, we are attaching labels to IDs, not people, because we don't have recognition, you know, we don't know who they are. And second, there are these very clear silos between this. So, you know, the data doesn't move across the silos, right? One very bad example of how we are misusing it is today our, uh, you know, in, in the whole world, HR people are looking at asking for your Facebook profile and along with your resume, right? So that's a breach of privacy in some sense, which is openly we are breaching privacy in that way, right? Because we know what you do online uh, and we want to, you know, we, we are trying to hire you and your, your political views will now play a role in whether this company will hire you or not, for example, right? So, I think we are we we have not thought about such things, but we are already doing it. So we need to worry about it. But yeah, labeling people should never happen, and labeling them for the use cases is is okay, but not across okay. use cases. Um, React to that. So they, I mean, I think I think labeling happens whether or not we have technology, uh, right? Like we have implicit association happening all the time when you're on when you're when you're hi when you're hiring or doing searches. And so I think there is there is a second problem of like how do we make sure humans don't label people based on the data that they have, right? Um, but I think I agree with uh, Dr. Shailesh that I think privacy is not just about like 
holding data together. It's about the choice that you're making and the control you have on how, how the data is used. And the problem today is like the Facebooks of the world don't give the give pretend to give users choice, but they don't really give users any choice, right? Um, but every Facebook, there are there are companies on the other side that actually are saying that no, we need more. We need to push the boundaries of privacy. We need to push how much control we need to give to the users and make it usable so that users can control, control how they use the data. And um, I think I think the, as these tech, uh, another another example, of the credit card. The reason people are more comfortable using credit cards today is because of the technologies like SSL, which which sort of show that you can actually communicate on the internet with security. So as these privacy and security technologies improve, uh, some of the things that are not private today will be private while allowing things like AI and machine learning. Uh, so uh, there is uh, another uh, aspect. Uh, the thing is uh, who owns the data? So for example, um, we talked about gene sequences or we have talked about certain uh, profiles about a person that we could uh, collect. And uh, suppose that makes up, uh, that is monetized, or that makes a huge impact in the world. So, for example, my gene uh, sequence can take care of all the uh, various viruses that would come in future, and it can be it can be used to generate antibodies. Then, um, you know, who owns this data and this public and proprietary data and the related uh, uh, data related issues? Um, any thoughts on those? I think that's a good question. I think, I think if, I, I think, I think people should sort of be owning their own data, but then if you are sort of having data being collected by a certain system, it should be clear, um, clearly specified who owns the data. And today, it's like whoever collects the data owns it, and that may not be the right way. That is not definitely not the right way to sort of think about it. So, if for example you share something with your friend, then both of you have joint ownership of that. And right now. Right now, only the platform owns it. So I think I think these things need to be spelled out more clearly. Yeah, agree. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, you know the person who generates the data uh, owns the data, not the person who collects it, right? And uh, you know GDPR and other systems have a philosophy around this, which we need to adopt, whatever that is, and. Monetization of data. If uh, if the if the so this is a new economy that has to evolve around data, uh, data monetization by the companies who are improving their products and services and benefiting from it should share the revenue with the people who are participating in their ecosystem as well. This has never been done before, but I think there is a good debate that can happen around this. That uh, you know, if uh, and and obviously all the control has to be with the user. I, you know, the I was traveling to Mumbai a few days, uh, and every time I went to from an airport to a hotel to a office location, Google Maps was asking me how was it, how was it, how was it, and uh, it was very scary. The Google Map is like following me throughout, and I'm not even using a Google Map, and you know, it is just following me. So it is scary. And then you know, if I give that feedback, and Google is using it to rate a airport or whatever, then what is my contribution in that feedback, uh, you know, and all that. So, and especially in healthcare, like you said, uh, you know, genomics data and all that will become more and more valuable. You know, giving a rating is still okay, but you know, that kind of a genomic data. So the the importance of data um, uh, and uh, the, the effect and impact of it on improving the systems and the business value that companies are deriving from it the the end to end economy has to thought about and the the uh, i think the end user has not yet benefited from that so i think this is a debate and somebody talked about blockchain and ai i think this is a good imagine a data element has a blockchain registry that anybody who uses it and accesses it has to pay for it in some sense right and the, you know that is one way to look at how this can be implemented yeah. So one thought I would like to add to that is that it bring exactly this perspective about ownership. So I guess maybe, you know, uh, and I hate to bring lawyers into any discussion, but uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry already if I'm offending anyone in the audience who has a law degree or background, is that um, I think that essentially we have to start bringing the asset laws into this whole thing. 
So all of us have assets of various kinds. It could be physical assets like land and home and cars, but also you know other other things that we own like money and whatnot. So maybe our data about us eventually becomes assets and is controlled by asset laws. And maybe uh, if it becomes an asset, it's a digital asset like many digital assets we have. And then, I mean, we have already laws like, you know, the works that we have published, uh, let us say you've written a book or whatever else, you own the digital rights to it. So similarly, maybe those kind of asset laws and eventually one can start thinking in terms of, well, I own it and I can give it to someone for uh, a limited amount of time for a limited use uh, with a certain amount of revenue that we generated from that, right? So it becomes a, there's a marketplace for it. And let us say if Google wants it, then they can have it for up, up to a certain amount, right? So, and actually, what will I want? I will want, uh, one I want is no, an absolute guarantee or at least some degree of redressal that if my data is used to harm me, then I will have recourse to it. Right, I, I will, I will call that the hygiene factor. It's like you go to a restaurant, the restaurant may be top rated, but if you see a cockroach in your plate, you're going to walk out, right? So that's a hygiene factor that nothing bad should happen to me. And then if something good can happen to me, like if I get some benefit, then I might agree to rent my data or my profile. And I'll use the word rent because I want it to be a limited time contract. Maybe next year, my value might go up. So I want to renegotiate that contract. So maybe something like that eventually might emerge, which now brings sort of the economics, the, uh, you know, the legal and you know, all these aspects together, as well as some kind of a safety and security and insurance against it. And if all that stuff starts happening, then maybe it levels out the playing field for all the actors concerned. Who knows? Uh, uh, and again, the you know, uh, yeah, and, and people's attitudes and all come into that factor. Yeah. Um, uh, Doctor P M, there are a couple of questions. Um, one is uh, about uh, um, uh, you know the uh, use of annotators to um, help manage the data and ensure that it is uh, high quality. Uh, that's uh, one question. And second question was about, uh, um, uh, you know, the state archives, which have assembly proceedings and government orders and everything which is available. And these kinds of data sets, uh, what are your views and what how you could use them in um, HSS projects related to it? Um, thank you, Professor Kamal. Yes, I did see that the question about annotators, I'll try to answer because the context was slightly different in the in the text that was along the question. But so the context that I have is, for example, um, we have survey companies in India who carry out surveys for social science researchers, both in India and abroad. Um, and how do we ensure that they don't fudge data or, um, or do any, any kind of manipulation that we do not want? To be very honest, I do not think there's a foolproof way of ensuring that. We too have done this before. And what we did was we made sure that the enumerators were trained in front of us. We were in the same room as them. Um, that was one thing. And of course, we cannot be on the field with them all the time. So the, the RA who was working with us, she would do these surprise visits um, along with the enumerators, just to see the kind of the kind of work that they were doing, and I also think after some after quite a bit of experience just working with data, um, it might not be that difficult to figure out if something has been fudged. There might be something systematic to it, but I do not have much experience there. So I, I, I do not want to speak, but this is what we did. We made sure we were in the same room as the enumerators or the annotators in this case, when they were being trained, um, all the data that they were entering was being entered into a tablet and they weren't writing it down because whenever we write things down and we digitize them, there's some loss in translation, transcription there. And um, there were these surprise visits that the research assistant was doing to make sure that the enumerators were actually doing what you, they were in a way being paid for to do. And that is one. And, and the second one, yes, I did see the comment about archive, um, archiving um, state 
assembly debates i think and categorizing them variously so i i again think that that is great work but like i said we need much more of it india is a huge country um we have about 70 or 80 years of catching up to do this is only post independence i mean there's also work to be done going back historically so um again i think we need more people even looking at these archives we need to know how are these archives being digitized who gains access to it is there a price do we actually physically have to go there is it available online um and then what kind of research questions can we can we use from them if they are about state assembly debates um so even at tcpd we had a researcher who looked at the parliamentary question hour and we also have a data portal that goes along with this where you can explore the kind of questions being asked who asks them um and what kind again what kind of questions are being asked from various politicians across the country um but again when we ask research questions like this i think one needs to be careful about is when politicians ask such questions in the parliament or in the assembly how much of it is signaling posturing versus how much is i mean do they actually care about their constituents i mean i think that is something that i mean as social scientists we need to figure yeah. out yeah so uh, um, right uh, and i also see that many of these uh, questions that you are posing are also um, technology driven um, solutions could be there and there is a good amount of uh, um, you know uh, technology and uh, humanities technology helping humanities and humanities helping us to understand the social aspects of um, yes. uh, the people and other things um, yes. for the uh, uh, thank you you all for the want of time it's already um, you know 8:40 i i really appreciate all of you staying on for this uh, round table and i think we touched upon many of the important issues of this and also got a broader perspective both from the data and the ai point of view again i thank you all for being there and then over to deva for uh, the next part of the uh, program yeah thank you very much kamal and thank you very much professor uh, jaydeep priyamada ashwin and uh, dr shalish it was uh, you know really nice uh, you know uh, hearing from you thank you very much again for your time and uh, for uh, being part of this thank you so um uh, sorry that uh, you know we are uh, seriously running uh, you know a little bit late so i think we can close before i close i request um, um varma konala varma who is the ceo of the ai initiative of triple it hyderabad which is uh, inai to you know give some closing remarks and then we will close thank you thanks deva i'll, I'll keep this short as we're already way over time right uh, so uh, you know as 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 they were said right uh, as I'll, i'll be the co conspirator with deva in leading this ai initiative where we'll be creating data sets and uh, pursuing solutions and uh, healthcare and smart mobility to start with and uh, other domains later on so literally everything we discuss today we'll have to tackle it right as we go along creating these data sets and then creating these ai solutions right uh so they're very pertinent right like and empathize with them as we because we, we are grappling with this question so the past one month as we go about what kind of data sets we're going to create right all these privacy concerns and what kind of solutions we're going to create uh, these are all the questions we 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 discussed and especially the privacy and federated learning right pretty much everything that we discussed today right so uh, we'll, we'll have more discussions on this subject right so we'll have more talks right and i look forward to that thanks deva yeah thank you thank you varma and thank you everyone thanks uh, you know it's uh, we'll close now thank you very much bye 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 everybody thank you thank you bye.